Imperial Knights. Through the smoke and fires and battle do the knights stride, pistons and servo motors groaning and thumping with every thunderous step. They stand tall and proud in the face of any enemy. The magnificent designs of their heraldry, emblazoned over armour painted in shining bright colours for all to see. Their ion shields shimmer as enemy fire blasts ineffectively against them, creating a halo of holy light around these towering war engines. Shell, rocket and lasbeam ricochet harmlessly from their ionic barriers, and the knights march through it all without fear. Victory is what they seek, for themselves and for their household, for their emperor, and they shall have it. Within the mighty armoured shell, the noble pilot, a scion of a long bloodline whose members have mastered the use of their gigantic mechanical steeds over millennia, sits upon their throne mechanicum, men and women of honour, chivalry, Pride as well as formidable warriors. By them are the knights' fearsome weapons directed. Just one of their number can annihilate countless foes and turn the tide of battle, and entire hosts can conquer star systems. The origins of the Imperial Knights go back further in time than the rise of the Emperor on Holy Terror. The first night worlds were settled during mankind's earliest expansion into the stars, and most have weathered through all of humanity's great trials and tribulations. There remain to this day great bastions against the dark. Fragments of ancient data slates suggest that many of the earliest human colonists to planets outside the solar system encountered all manner of lethal flora and fauna, freak meteorological events, Near inhospitable environments, hostile alien species and viral outbreaks. Given that the raw materials they needed to found their colonies came from cannibalising their own long march ships, the settlers had no choice but to endure whatever challenges they faced. They did so thanks to their pioneering human spirit, as well as standard template construction technology. These STC machines can each replicate a specific device perfectly. With them, the colonists fashion tools, shelter, power generators, transports, and more. Some settlers use them to create towering constructs called night suits. These formidable armoured walkers could traverse dangerous terrain, prevail through horrific climatic conditions, and be used by their pilots to defend their settlements against attack. Many colonies produced them in great numbers. Piloted by the most skilled and charismatic of colonists, they became the mailed fist of human expansionism, smashing aside any and all threats. None were aware that while the night suits served the colonists, those piloting them were being irrevocably changed by them. To operate a night suit... Its pilot uses a technological marvel known as the Throne Mechanicum. These mount neural jacks and cerebral uplinks that directly connect knight and pilot. Though no one knows how or why, the longer they fought in their suits, the more authoritarian the pilots became. Over a few generations, notions of chivalric conduct Ritual observance, loyalty and fealty became completely embedded among the pilots and changed the dynamic of their colonies. These pilots became the first nobles of the original houses, and those they protected became akin to feudal serfs. In a surprisingly short time, their worlds became socially conservative and inward-looking in comparison to other colony worlds, and were seen as culturally and technologically backward. This, however, ultimately protected them from the apocalypse mankind later endured in what has come to be known as Old Night. In that horrific time, humanity was almost wiped out. Rampant, uncontrolled psychers drowned worlds in warp storms and demonic incursions. Thinking machines carried out sector-wide purges and 
megalomaniacal overlords conducted devastating gene wars. The Night Worlds had few of these problems. Most killed any psychers they found among their population, considering them to be witches. They forbade the creation of thinking machines, emphasising the value of hard labour, and refused to dabble with their own genetics. As humanity appeared to collapse all around them, the knights fortified their holdings, patrolled their borders, and hoarded resources. For thousands of years, they persisted in this way, Though the cultures on some night worlds regressed and their technologies were slowly worn down, a surprisingly large number emerged from old night intact. It was only much later, when the Emperor sought to unite humanity with the Great Crusade, that humanity rediscovered the night worlds, which were found slowly by rogue traders and vanguard battle groups. Over a period of decades, Hundreds were brought into the imperial fold. Tens of thousands of knights strode the battlefields of the Great Crusade, slaughtering Xenos in droves and crushing those human worlds that refused the Emperor's rule. Both the Imperial Administratum and the Mechanicum of Mars recognised the formidable power of the night worlds. Not only were they bastions of military power, but they also held ancient technology that many believed had been lost forever. Many night worlds chose to follow Mars, or had little choice but to join with the Mechanicum uh, through their deep need of the technological expertise of the Martian Magi uh, to maintain the functionality of their night suits, becoming uh, Questor Mechanicus. Others, however, pledged themselves to the Emperor and to Terra, uh, becoming Questor Imperialis. When the disastrous Horus heresy embroiled the Emperor's realm in civil war, a large number of night worlds turned traitor. Yet many more, shielded from spiritual corruption by the conditioning of their thrones, joined the battle on the side of the Loyalists. They proved their honour then, and have ever since. To this day, the surviving night worlds are vital linchpins of the Imperial defence, protecting their allies from invaders. All the while, their crusading armies take the fight to the enemy, crushing them wherever they are found. Imperial knights maintain and use all manner of ancient technologies that no other element of the Imperium are known to have access to. It is largely thanks to the tech priests of the Omnissa, based on their mighty forge worlds, however, that the nobles can continue to take their night suits to war. Forge worlds are planets controlled by the Adeptus Mechanicus and are places of endless industry and rampant pollution. Upon these worlds, the priests of the Omnissa, the machine god, jealously hoard all their accumulated secrets and lore. The Forge Worlds are also nigh impregnable military strongholds, uh, boasting immense garrisons of cyborg, uh, lobotomized and robot soldiers, and a vast array of bizarre vehicles, armed with all manner of devastating weapons. These armies are frequently bolstered by knightly households. A majority of noble houses are associated with a particular Forge World, uh, because deep in the past the priests of the Omnissa won a Machiavellian a political contest among the different arms of the Great Crusade to exploit, control and influence the Night Worlds. The Tech Magi wanted the nobles' archaeotech and military might and succeeded in making many of them dependent on the Forge Worlds for vital technology and knowledge. In the past, the Adeptus Mechanicus settled many of the night worlds and trained the nobles' feudal orders of technicians in the ways of maintaining their night suits. And as a result, now virtually all knights bear a sign of the cult Mechanicus somewhere on their immense armoured forms as a reminder of the debt they owe Mars. Many knights' worlds and forge worlds maintain extremely strong trade relations with the Adeptus Mechanicus Vessels are bringing armaments, new night suits, tools and mining machinery to the houses and leaving with holds, packed with ores and foodstuffs. Now many night worlds are bastions of technological sophistication, defended by mighty fortresses and elite warriors. 
However, relations between Knight and Forge World vary greatly from planet to planet, noble to tech priest. Even those households that swear fealty to Mars are strong-willed warriors with codes of honour that prevent them from following the command of the Adeptus Mechanicus without question. The Throne Mechanicum are devices that are testament to the accomplishments of the age of technology, and they are a pinnacle of creation from that forgotten era. Throne Mechanicum allow a night suit to become an extension of the pilot's own body through the neural jacks connected directly to the cranial sockets. To pilot a night suit is for the machine's mechanical senses to become the driver's own. For an unprepared mind, such an experience would almost certainly cause madness. Thus, household nobles are conditioned from birth as well as cerebrally augmented uh, to endure it. When they come of age, or when a night suit is available, eligible young nobles undergo the ritual of becoming. In this rite, they are led to the house's sanctuary, a vast, fortified structure within their ancestral stronghold that contains the Chamber of Echoes. There, they are connected to one of their house's dormant thrones and are left for a full night. Thrones Mechanicum contain behavioural subroutines that weed out those not strong enough to control them and fight the young noble for control. It is the task of the aspirant to wrestle with the throne's energies, withstand the receipt of its cerebral engrams and imprint their own psyche upon it. The ritual of becoming has been known to drive aspirants mad and even kill them. Those who emerge victorious leave childhood behind and are ennobled with the mantle of knighthood. One of the most unusual elements of the Fro Mechanicum is that beyond their interface and control circuits, they also contain mnemic engram reliquaries and spectron ionic foci that let them store synaptic echoes of the pilots they have bonded with before. Therefore, every throne is haunted by the ghosts of their former controllers, which communicate with a knight's pilot. Nobles speak of whispering voices, visions and other strange manifestations that provide them with guidance, wisdom and advice. Armagers, among the smallest class of knight, do not use throne mechanicum. Instead, their pilots use a helm mechanicum. These are placed upon their heads and connected to the pilot's cerebrum via prefrontal sockets and do not require a full becoming ritual for the neural interfacing to work. As a result, there is less prestige in piloting an armiger, compounded by the fact that some Helm's Mechanicum are neurally slaved to the command impulses of a larger knight. Accepting this mental serfdom gives a pilot the rank of bondsman, and while it is not as glorious as full knighthood, is not seen as dishonourable. Typically, these pilots hail from lower status, noble houses, minor offshoots of distant bloodlines, or even survivors of other households fallen on hard times. Others are even from the finest troops of a night world's peasantry. Some belong to a specialist suborder established by knightly houses and are experts, fated from birth, in piloting armigers. Sacristans are skilled artisans, responsible for maintaining their household knight suits. They learn their skills in the tech shrines of the Adeptus Mechanicus, as well as their house's unique knowledge and specialist skills from master sacristans. As a result, they tend to be insular and exhibit many similar traits to those of tech priests. Their appearance, customs, traditions and organisation are influenced by their world's culture. Equally, the attitudes of nobles to their sacristans varies across the households. They can be regarded as wise servants, hidebound engineers or even as suspiciously secretive spies of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Sacristans are expected to follow their masters to war, working between battles or riding out in armoured crawlers, uh, forge landers or servitor striders to perform battlefield repairs. 
Some operate from devotional structures deployed in the midst of a war zone. Forge shrines are the most common of these, armoured refuelling depots with servo armatures, which can be used to carry out rapid repairs, which can even be remotely operated by the Sacristians. The Questor Imperialis Imperial night worlds are typically ruled over by one or more noble houses, each with their own heraldry, insignia, traditions and character. Though often hidebound and intractable are matters of honour, the noble houses make for powerful allies, and when they send their imperial knights to war, the enemies of the emperor tremble. Questor Imperialis night worlds are those who have sworn allegiance to the Emperor and Terra rather than Mars. Like any night world, uh, their home planets are immensely varied. Bleak, mountainous wastelands, hard-edged idols of deep forests and rolling plains, airless deserts dotted with hab domes, uh, primordial wildernesses of volcanic jungle, ocean-locked island worlds and countless others all support nightly civilizations. Yet as much as each of these worlds differ, and as much as those differences have done to shape the societies that inhabit them, certain similarities hold true across virtually every Questor Imperialis night world in the Emperor's realm. Most Questor Imperialis worlds organise their populations on a feudal structure, dividing lands into fiefdoms, or whatever local term is used. Each of these territories is ruled by one or more nobles, with the population they are responsible for toiling, farming, herding, mining, quarrying, or producing in their liege's name. In exchange for loyal service, the nobles protect their people from off-world invaders or from native dangers. In turn, every knight owes their allegiance to a high-ranking local leader. These are most commonly called barons, though this term varies from world to world. Other examples include Marshal, Countess, Seneschal or Marchalord. Each of these leaders then bows the knee to their world's high monarch. Depending on the world, a baron may be the head of their own noble house. On some, a single noble house may rule the entire planet. These immensely powerful entities are known as the Great Houses and include renowned institutions such as House Griffith, Cadmus, Terrin, and Hawkshroud. The cultures of the Questor Imperialis worlds vary greatly. Though most households uh, feature veneration of the Emperor in their traditions, architecture, iconography, heraldry, and rituals, each planet has an enormously long history, uh, unique heroes, as well as uh, geographical features which over time have moulded the mindset and practices of the nobles of the 41st millennium. Some Questor Imperialis worlds are run by repressive patriarchies or matriarchies. Others operate martial meritocracies where skill in battle is more important than lineage. A handful follow restricted democratic procedures, with certain nobles enfranchised to cast a vote on who should be their world's leader for a period of time. <sighs> Insanity. Whether that be for life or a number of years. Most night worlds have significant operations dedicated to sourcing raw materials, which they require to support their own populations as well as trade with other worlds. Few Questor Imperialis worlds have large-scale industrial centres uh, due to their long history of isolation and cultural backwardness, and most, but not all, have low population densities. This has resulted in many being surprisingly unspoiled in comparison to many other imperial worlds. However, uh, many over the millennia have faced invasion and war, and some harbour mutation, sedition or madness as a result. These are dangers the rulers of a night world must forever watch for and be ready to suppress the moment they are discovered. Fighting these evils serves as a good practice. Regardless of how they come to hold the title, on a Questor Imperialis world, the word of its ruling high monarch is law. Of course, there will be times when at least a small number of nobles are engaged in some form of politicking or involved in disputes that may demand honour jewels or nightly jousts to settle. 
Yet should the High Monarch issue the summons for war, these issues must be put to one side. To reject the order, or to be seen to be undermining the High Monarch's efforts in favour of personal gain, or to achieve a petty victory over a rival, is to bring much dishonour upon a noble's name and house. It takes little provocation, however, for a noble to mount their throne. The rush of power given to an individual in control of a weapon as mighty as a knight suit is an intoxicant in its own right. Battle and war are also seen as escapes from the tedium of courtly life. In times of peace, a noble spends much of their time attending to the needs of their serfs, dealing with administrative matters of state or conducting long esoteric rituals that have grown both in length and complexity over the millennia. Whilst any noble uh, conducts their duties with all the stoicism expected of a person of their standing, they will go to war as often as the opportunity presents itself. When they do so, it is with much pomp, ceremony and fanfare, their heraldry gleaming and their banners fluttering in the wind. Regardless of whether they go to war in response to a call for aid from an embattled imperial commander, racing to save a beleaguered planet in the grip of alien invasion, or setting off on a grand crusade to avenge a perceived slight, the knights go to war in formations known as lances. Most often, groups of these detachments will go to battle, each led by a sufficiently powerful baron. Though they may travel in groups, it is not unheard of for knights to operate alone once they have reached the battlefield, each noble bringing death to the foe in whichever way they see fit. High monarchs lead the march against the greatest threats. They do so often at the head of their exalted court, a body of the highest-ranking knights of their house. Some of these warriors are close relatives of the high monarch, lesser rulers from the homeworld, the monarch's finest warriors, or their closest friends. Regardless, they are sublime commanders and warriors, capable of defeating almost any opposition they might encounter. When fighting to defend their own worlds, the speed and manoeuvrability of knights is usually sufficient to get them to where they are needed. But when they take the fight to foes on other planets, the nobles must use transports to reach their designated war zone. Some night worlds, especially those ruled by houses pledged to terror, maintain their own fleets of transport and combat cruisers, often former Imperial Navy craft. Others, including the vast majority of Questor Mechanicus night worlds, instead utilise explorator craft and mass conveyance barges provided by an allied forge world. These ships ferry nobles, knight suits, Sir Christians, attendant household servants, courtiers and bonds militia to a war, often alongside the towering engines of the Legios Titanicus or massed maniples of cyborg Skitari. Different night worlds also approach combat drops in different ways. Though most noble houses deploy their knights using heavy haulers and mass transporters, there are some that employ armoured drop keeps for the task, using auxiliary air forces of lightning and thunderbolt fighters to clear landing zones, or, in the case of the Mechanicus-aligned house Faustaris, they make use of huge and ancient teleportariums that translocate the knight suit straight into battle amidst coronae of crackling warplight. Questor Mechanicus through mutual and binding oaths, the Adeptus Mechanicus have forged alliances with many night worlds. In return for technical aid and reciprocal protection, these Questor Mechanicus houses send forth their adamantine night suits to honour any request made by their allies. The knights of Questor Mechanicus houses are regularly expected to uphold their ancient pacts, with whichever forge world they are bonded. This may be to defend against an invasion of the Forge World, accompanying a mission to recover lost technology, quash an outbreak of tech heresy, defend a mining world supplying essential natural resources, or to join an explorator fleet. In battle, Questor Mechanicus Knights are frequently tasked with supporting the Titan Legions, either fighting in battle alongside them 
or serving as scouts or flank guards. The commitments expected from a Questor Mechanicus house may well be as little as a single night, up to an entire great house. It is not unheard of for a detachment of knights to be seconded to a Titan Legion on a permanent basis. Should they do this, then those knights change their vows of allegiance, as well as their heraldry, to reflect the legio they now serve. To fight beside such mighty engines of war as the Titans is considered a great honour indeed, for there are few greater symbols of the Omnisire's power. Some Questor Mechanicus worlds are based on Forge worlds. Those who control their own planets operate them on a feudal basis, similar to the Questor Imperialis, though with some difference. They have considerably less cultural and martial autonomy due to vows they have made to their patron forge world. They are regularly visited by conclaves of tech magi, who while on the one hand bring resources and expertise, also bring scrutinising eyes and watch the household's rituals carefully. The nobles of a Questor Mechanicus household are also more bound to the worship of the Omnisire, they wear robes in the hues of their patron forge world, exhibit the Adeptus Mechanicus cog on their armour and as tattoos, have electro designs inlaid into their flesh, and sport mechanical augmetics and bionics that aid them to mesh more closely with the systems of their night suits. Their domains also bear the signs of the close involvement of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Unlike many Questor Imperialis worlds, Questor Mechanicus planets feature vast strip mines, manufactorums that rumble with the sound of industry day and night, and continent-sized agriplexes, all there to efficiently extract natural resources. Whilst this means that pollution is rife on many of these worlds, the knights benefit from easy replenishment of stocks of armoured suits, weapons and munitions. Thus they are almost always very well equipped, can replace losses more quickly and mount fresh crusades at a much more rapid pace. For many Questor Mechanicus worlds, even with these advantages, it is all but impossible for them to keep up with the relentless demands of the forge world they are allied with. For all this, the nobles of such a world are no less proud, honourable or strong-willed. They still rule their vast domains, march out to protect their borders, and owe ultimate fealty to their world's supreme ruler, who most often takes the revered title of Princeps, or Princeps, depending on how you pronounce High Gothic. The appearance of Questor Mechanicus nobles is generally more sombre than that of their counterparts in the imperial aligned noble houses, and they are often less unruly and willful. Their ties to the Sir Christian orders are strong, untroubled by suspicions of divided loyalties. Their battle doctrines are bellicose and expertly cogitated, while the bond that each noble forges with their throne mechanicum and the machine spirit of their knight is nigh symbiotic. When the lances of the Questor Mechanicus knights go to battle, they do so with devastating efficiency and absolute Unified Conviction The cult Mechanicus venerates the Omnisire as the god of machines, or Deus Mechanicus. Its adherents see the machine god as the source of all technology, and believe in the complete superiority of the machine over flesh. Those night worlds with the closest ties to the forge worlds often share their beliefs, but this is far from a universal trend. Many other knightly houses choose to venerate the Divine Emperor instead. This has led to many rivalries between houses of differing belief over the long millennia. Ever since the Horus heresy, some have even come to blows due to disputes, though most are settled honourably through duels and contests mediated by another neutral party. Some imperial scholars believe that the Omnisire and the Emperor are one and the same, or just different aspects of the same divine force. It is said that the Emperor 
when he arrived on Mars before the start of the Great Crusade, channeled the power of the Omnissiah to heal the irreparably damaged leg of one knight's suit, fulfilling an ancient prophecy of the occult Mechanicus and thus proving his machine divinity. Whatever the truth of the matter, the Emperor was able to forge a pact between Mars and Terra that still exists today. There now follows a brief exploration of some of the more well-known knightly houses. House Tyrannis. Honour the Forge. Honour the Primus Ordinus. The knights of House Tyrannus are true servants of the machine god and bear the honour of being the first of the knightly houses, for they were founded upon Mars itself centuries before any other. They knelt before the Emperor at the same time the Martian Tech Magi signed the Treaty of Olympus Mons, which unified the Red Planet and Terra. The nobles of House Tyrannis piloted the very first night suit prototypes developed on Mars during the Age of Technology. Having always been based upon the Red Planet, they have never been forced to survive alone on a frontier, sheltering behind high fortress walls against the perils of the outer dark. Thus, their culture has not been shaped by a necessary isolation. Uniquely among all the households, the subtle, mind-altering technology that over time turned the nobles of other houses into feudal overlords is not present in the knights piloted by the nobles of House Tyrannis. As a result, they do not operate on a feudal structure. They refuse to share how their Thrones Mechanicum operate. The reason as to why most Thrones Mechanicum bear this technology, and why those of House Tyrannus do not incorporate it, are now lost to time. That has not prevented high-powered observers uh, from suggesting that the first nobles were already fiercely loyal to the Mechanicum, and that they were an integral part of Mars's defensive infrastructure. House Tyrannus's crest bears the crimson and stylized cog of Mars showing their eternal devotion to the Red Planet and the Martian priesthood. Though many other households aligned with the Adeptus Mechanicus have adopted the same colour, Tyrannus was the first. The sword that bisects the household's crest is claimed to have been added after the Horus heresy. During that terrible time, House Tyrannus suffered horrific losses in the internecine fighting. Legends tell that only two knights remained. One of these, Raph Maven, insisted on adding the emblem in honour of his fallen kinsman. In the years that followed, Maven committed himself to rebuilding his house. Thanks to his tireless efforts and the skill of the Martian tech adepts, House Tyrannus survived its darkest hour and grew into the formidable host it is in the era Indomitus. This recovery from almost total annihilation has convinced the nobles of House Tyrannus that the Omnissiah will always protect them, no matter the circumstances. This deep and unshakable faith has served them very well on countless battlefields. House Tyrannus strives to fight harder than any other knight house to demonstrate they are worthy of their preeminence. They have been put to the test in recent years, defending the routes to the soul system from heretic incursions, aided by the powerful relics their alliance with the Adeptus Mechanicus affords them. House Tyrannus has fought countless wars over the last ten millennia, ranging from the fabled War of the Beasts against the Orcs, a period of history that I believe is best forgotten by all, to the colossal ongoing campaigns of the Indomitus Crusade. On Tarsok V, Knights of the House battled a demonic invasion. Seneschal Halver's forces waded through a flood of plague bearers to kill the great unclean one at the incursion's head. They crushed Dark Mechanicum forces on the artificial world of Hyperia Free and annihilated pirate enclaves in the Cold Trade Wars. Alongside House Raven, and Dracus. They also fought in the War of Recovery, alongside the Adeptus Mechanicus in the Mortium Chain system, wresting much ancient human technology from the Xenos warlords there. In the later years of M41, 
House Tyrannus committed many of its number to the defence of Cadia, and many more to the Indomitus Crusade itself. The House roused many of its most ancient night suits from slumber and readied their greatest archaeotech relics for these coming wars, which they knew would be like nothing the House had seen for millennia. House Crast Crush the Serpent House Crast legend tells that the night world of Cyrus's, their world, was the first of its kind to be rediscovered at the outset of the Great Crusade. The nobles of that planet showed no hesitation in joining the Emperor, making House Crast one of the longest-serving defenders of mankind's realm. It is a fact of which they remain rightly proud. The knights of House Crast are characterised by a deep bitterness, one they can trace back ten thousand years. They fought during the Great Crusade, as many noble houses did, as new allies of the Mechanicum and clad in the Red of Mars, a powerful military force even before their unification with the rest of mankind. They were bolstered greatly thanks to their alliance with the Martian priesthood. While the nobles of House Crast took cannon and blade to the foes of the Emperor, those of lesser houses remained on Cyrus's to consolidate the world's new alliances. Supplies and technology were in constant supply there from nearby Mars. Every young noble of House Crast is taught that when Horus rebelled against the Emperor, his treachery took a fearsome toll on Cyrus's. Being close to the Sol system, it was caught in Horus's path as he carved a route to Terra. The traitor titans of Legio Mortis, the Death's Heads, were the chief component of the invasion force that came to Cyrus's. This was a most bitter reality for those of House Crass to accept, for they had fought alongside the titans of that legion over many battlefields. When the nobles of the house returned to Cyrus's in the wake of the Horus heresy, they found their world in ruins. Once its vast oceans and woodlands teemed with life, the attack saw it reduced to a toxic wasteland dotted with skeletal, petrified forests and huge open basins where seas were drained. Shorelines were reduced from wave-washed beaches to dry cliff faces. Blasted islands rose above empty seas. And the once mighty strongholds of the other houses were rendered as little more than blackened ruins. House Crast was the only house to survive the Horus heresy, and a hatred burned in their hearts for the horrors which had been inflicted upon them that has not dimmed in ten thousand years. The house's ties with the Adeptus Mechanicus only grew stronger after these events. The nobles relied much on the generosity of Mars to replace their losses and to rebuild what they could of their homeworld, providing what resources they could to the Red Planet in exchange. They constructed shielded strongholds to replace the destroyed keeps and slowly recoup their numbers. Every noble swore an oath to forever be the bane of traitors and to be forever loyal to Mars. After the Horus heresy, the house also changed its crest, replacing the lion rampant for an iron fist squeezing the life from a serpent that represents chaos. Ever since, House Crast has been at the forefront of the wars against the Arch Enemy, maintaining their deep hatred for traitor titans and the Legio Mortis especially. Knights of House Crast fought valiantly to defend Cadia, racing there once they heard the Death's Head were present. And after the Great Rift emerged, and the forces of the Arch Enemy were identified across the galaxy, House Crast launched six Crusades of Vengeance to the Forge worlds of Vos, Phaeton, Erdesh, Styges, Artema Majoris, and Graia, to link with the Adeptus Mechanicus forces and bring the fight to the traitors. The killing of a traitor titan is a cause of much celebration for the nobles of House Crast. Claiming one of the Legio Mortis leads to a great triumph in honour of the Slayer, who henceforth is known as a headtaker. These mighty heroes are held in the highest esteem by all of their household, as well as serfs, and are permitted to bear the symbol of the broken death's head on their knight's suit or tabard. House Raven. Honour inviolate, Colossi Eternal. 
The knights of House Raven seek vengeance above all else. Their numbers have been depleted. Their homeworld, Colossi, has been stolen away by some malevolent power. Now they spend every waking moment seeking out news of it and those responsible for its fall and vanishing. House Raven will not rest until their quest is done. In the recent past, House Raven not only boasted the greatest number of knights of any house and the fealty of dozens of lesser households, but also one of the mightiest fortresses in the entire Imperium, the Keep in Violet. So large was this immense stronghold that its tallest towers jutted into the void. Its walls were hundreds of feet thick and bristled with macro cannon emplacements. It was a place of buttressed bastions and armoured towers. Even its roots stretched deep, its vaults full of ancient relics. Some observers believe that the keep was comparable to the Fang, the fortress monastery of the Space Wolves, or even the Imperial Palace in size and strength. The keep itself remains a featured part of the house's emblem, represented by a tall black tower. Colossi, their homeworld, was a place of immense industry. Mid cities were islands of steel and smoke among deep core shafts and strip mine canyons. House Raven's power was maintained by its vast resources as well as its alliance with the forge world of Metallica. The Knights Houses Sacristans, uh, known collectively as the Iron Brotherhood, received exemplary training in their arts there and the tech magi of that world provided vital expertise. It was said that House Raven's power matched that of a Titan Legion. Colossi fell during the heretic invasion of the Caradon Sector, a vicious war that cost the Imperium thousands of ships and billions of lives. In keeping with their oaths of allegiance, Princeps Graven Raven... <laughs> Grave and Raven, led some 80% of his house's strength to the Obelis subsector to aid Metallica, leaving the defence of Colossi in the hands of a faithful warrior called Sir Havlorn. A sizable contingent of knights remained, as well as a large garrison of other forces. Combined with the formidable strength of the keep in Violet itself, Colossi could still hold against conventional forces for months or even years. Plenty of time for Sir Havlon to request the return of Raven's full strength, should any invaders prove too mighty. But the enemy, who had designs on their world, was far from conventional. The demon prince Belacor wanted Colossi for his own. The Dark Master began his campaign by sowing seeds of doubt and resentment among the population of Colossi. He enslaved some to his will, who seeded cults and performed acts of sabotage. Belacor himself worked his power. Over time, these efforts effected a subtle change. At first, this was put down to faulty instruments or organic error. But over time, it became unquestionable. The nights on Colossi were growing longer. Panic spread as malevolent entities seemed to stalk people in the shadows. Despite much effort on the part of Sir Havlorn's forces, such predators were never found. Still, the nobles sent out messages to the princeps, complaining that a dire threat was growing. He ordered the shepherding of the people into the cities so that they could be better protected, Yet, one by one, the fortified settlements dropped off the Vox network. Soon the keep in Violet stood alone. Sir Havlorn had no idea that all this time some of the house's own sacristans had been corrupted by Belacor. When he mobilised his warriors to arms after demons attacked the keep in Violet in force, it became apparent that many thrones mechanicum had been tainted. Once loyal knights turned on their fellows, Belacor himself manifested to oversee the capture of the fortress. What happened next was even stranger. After Colossi fell, it vanished altogether, as though swallowed by the warp. 
When Princep Graven Raven learned of the disappearance of his homeworld, he declared that his remaining knights would not become free blades. Such a choice would only further cement the victory of their enemies in his eyes. Instead, his house swore a new oath to roam the stars and battle heretics wherever they found them and seek news of Colossi's fate. They would hunt down whoever had wounded their house so mortally and seek vengeance. House Raven still fights in the manner it always did. Its knights march forward like an endless wall of red metal, large numbers of knights crusader providing overwhelming support. At their head are the companions, an inner circle of the knightly elite. These warriors maintain new spheric communication, working in close consort uh, to crush the foe. Word has reached the Inquisition of what might have happened to Colossi. Mysterious reports speak of a fractured world in the Imperium Nihilus, which emerged apparently from nowhere and is home to nightmarish horrors, monstrous machines and a body of deformed chaos knights who call themselves House Corvax. House Volker, for the gilded glory of the Omnisire. House Volker is regarded as one of the greater houses among those aligned with the Adeptus Mechanicus, though its power is clearly visible whenever its knights stride the battlefield, guns blazing. The house is seen as being particularly reclusive and mysterious. This is a reputation the nobles of Volker see no reason to amend, content to keep their ways, rituals and traditions from the sight of outsiders. The homeworld of House Volker is Aureus IV, a mineral-rich planet in a crowded star system. Its allied forge world, Bellius Prime, was established nearby for the very purpose of exploiting Aureus IV's natural resources, as well as that of surrounding asteroid belts. The bond between both planets is strong indeed. The gold-plated servitor creatures toil upon them day and night to extract raw materials. The gilded house Volker crest proclaims their wealth. Beyond the central diadem, with the cog skull motif, none of the mysterious symbols are decipherable to any outside the learned yet secretive servants of the cult mechanicus. Whether the house's reclusive nature is due to a desire to hide some deep shame from others, demonstrates lack of trust or merely lack of interest in revealing much of their ways to others, is unclear, even to more studied observers of the nightly houses. House Volker's courts are full of tech priests and servitors that speak in coded machine language and number sequences, Unlike some other houses, House Volker welcomes tech magi into their bastions and upon their world without hesitation, seeing such beings not as outside interference but allies, integral to their way of life. Both nobles and priests take part in the house's mechanical ceremonies. Such events would be, should an outsider ever see them, disturbing to look upon and their meanings would be unclear, yet appear deeply sinister. But outsiders are not welcome within the steel-clad fortresses of House Volker, so few souls have even the slightest idea of what occurs there. When not at war, the nobles of House Volker hide every inch of their flesh with robes and hues of crimson, silver, white, black and gold in various combinations and patterns, and sometimes will wear gold masks that have blank expressions. The colours a noble wears is dictated by their rank, title and region of origin on Aureus IV, as well as more esoteric reasons. However, when the call to war comes, they put aside many of their curious trappings and stride out with all the determination and wrath a knightly house is known for. They place a premium upon well-coordinated plans for both attack and defence, always engaging the enemy at the optimal distance and by utilising carefully cogitated trajectories. This often results in Volker's knights waiting patiently for the enemy to draw close before annihilating them with searing barrages. It was they who first developed the tripartite lance, 
a formation later adopted by all other houses, in which the fire of a night warden, night crusader and night gallant are combined. In recent years, war has come both to Bellius Prime and Aureus IV. From beneath Bellius Prime's surface, necrons of the expansionist Sutek dynasty rise. On Aureus IV, many of the planet's most remote and inhospitable mountain ranges have proven to be immense necron tomb structures, encrusted with the rocky strata of past aeons. The bonds between the two worlds have been strengthened with each battle they have fought together against the Xenos. Both have stood firm against nigh endless legions of android warriors and metallic constructs. Forges have been fired day and night to produce weapons and munitions. Clade after clade of servitors have been worn through to keep production lines operating and mines open to find resources. Slowly but surely, however, the situation grows more desperate for House Volker, driving them ever closer to desperate measures that might reveal their secrets. House Cadmus They who are not our allies are our prey. Hailing from the heavily forested world of Racer, the nobles of House Cadmus are fiercely independent and peerless monster hunters. Once aligned with the forge world of Griffon IV, that planet's fall to the Tyranids of High Fleet Leviathan has freed the house from its obligations to the tech priests and they have reasserted their identity. House Cadmus, legend tells that when the Imperium first made contact with the nobles of Racer, they received a cold welcome and it was many years before tentative alliances were formed. When Baron Godfrey swore fealty to Forge World Griffon IV in exchange for sacristans and technology, knowing his house needed it, his fellow nobles were aghast, deeming the treaty a betrayal of all they stood for. Godfrey earned yet more ire when he changed the house's crest to incorporate the cog of the Adeptus Mechanicus. None opposed Godfrey openly, however, for the might of the Tech Magi of Griffon IV was behind him. For millennia, the knights of House Cadmus upheld their part of the bargain and suffered heavy losses in the defence of the Forge world against a tyrannid invasion that saw it fall. Since then, Baron Roland, the current ruler of Racer, has seized the opportunity to restore House Cadmus's ancient heraldry, replete with wings and crest of a slain mutant. His sacristans were horrified by this sacrilege against the Omnisire, but have no say in such a decision. Racer has always been troubled by high rates of mutation, the deformed creatures lurking within the world's forests and threatening its settlements. For thousands of years, the knights of House Cadmus have gathered every Midsummer's Eve to prepare for the annual hunt of these creatures. This much-celebrated event is known as the Cull. Bio-reading cogitators are attached to their night suits before every event, enabling each knight to track the number of monsters they have slain during the course of the hunt. The knight who claims the greatest number of kills is the winner of this macabre tourney, and will rule the affairs of the house for the next year. The creatures are so numerous that only the vast plateaus that pierce Rice's evergreen canopy are completely free from their touch, and it is on these highland plains that House Cadmus erect their fortresses, including their primary stronghold, Gollum Keep. This monolithic edifice was named, or so myth tells, after the mighty elementals that once haunted the planet's wildernesses, before they were hunted to extinction by the first Imperial Knights to settle on Rysa many thousands of years ago. Now only tribes of mutants remain, and House Cadmus chooses not to fully wipe them out. This is not out of loyalty or pity, but rather to maintain the tradition of the Cull, which also gives more youthful knights experience of combat before heading out to battles across the galaxy. Baron Roland was born of an old and powerful baronial family and hails from Swinford Hall, a cavernous and luxurious wing of Gollum Keep. 
An uncompromising man, he does not suffer fools and has demonstrated legendary courage in the face of the enemy by often leading from the front. He has an unbroken run of 32 victories in the cull. It is well that a leader of such experience rules given the losses suffered by House Cadmus on Griffin IV and the increasing dangers presented by the emergence of the Great Rift. The Cicitrix maledictum caused a sudden explosion of mutant numbers on Riser, and great hordes of the abominations destroyed agriplexes and peasant settlements at will in vengeful rampages against House Cadmus. Roland ordered the cull to end all culls, and marched at the head of the entire household. Weeks of slaughter followed, and many lives were lost before the mutants were driven back. In the aftermath, Roland ordered the raising of new fortifications to overlook the deepest woodlands. House Griffith. Honour and fury, courage and strength. The nobles of House Griffith are among the most skilled warriors of all their kind, raised on tales of daring valour and heroic deeds, their traditions and practices yield consummate bladesmen. In battle, their aggression is legendary. They crave the thrill of melee and seek out the largest foes, bringing them down with thunderous charges and precise blows. The homeworld of House Griffith is the volcanic planet of Dragon's End, which derives its name from the winged drakes that dwelled there millennia ago. They soared on the world's thermals and hunted the megasaur herds that grazed in the valleys before being hunted to extinction. It was the quick foundation of House Griffith that saw the irrevocable changes to the planet's primordial ecosystem. Dragon's End's first human settlers brought with them great herds of Terran horses, and in those days, as now, the nobles were adept riders. As their colonies expanded, they sought dominance over the Megasaur herds, which brought them into conflict with the planet's great drakes. Before the colonists constructed the first knight suits, they fought the drakes from horseback, wearing Baroque armour made from locally mined obsidian. In order to defeat the monstrous creatures, the nobles had to become superlative warriors and riders. Though many were killed, those who survived quickly became tough and strong. Nathaniel Griffith was among the greatest of the nobles, killing three dragons before becoming inaugural ruler of the new-found knightly house. Once the colonists constructed knight suits, it was only a matter of time before the dragons were exterminated. But despite the advent of this new technology, the nobles never forgot their heritage. To this day, the nobles of House Griffith are told the tales of the wars against the dragons and train on horses with traditional weapons such as lance and blade in one of the most stringent training regimes of any house. They are determined to maintain the legacy of their forebears' martial excellence and mental fortitude and ever seek to demonstrate themselves as worthy inheritors of their ancestors' bloody reputation to enemies allies, as well as fellow members of their house. Disputes are regularly settled with duels or jousts, and tournaments see families compete for standing and prestige. With some of their throne mechanicum dating back uh, to the time when the knights fought the drakes, even now members of House Griffith can commune with long-dead dragon slayers and hear the tales and stories of that fabled time directly from those who were there. The heraldry of House Griffith owes much to Nathaniel Griffith. He chose the crest which depicts the great dragon Alvrax, holding the broken lance with which Nathaniel slew him. The other half features a crimson demi-aquila on a field of black, symbolising the house's loyalty to the Imperium. The bone-coloured livery of House Griffith's knights is in honour of the legendary lance that Nathaniel wielded in battle from horseback, which was intricately carved and made from the femur of a great drake the hero slew. To this day, the Grand Master of the house bears a stylized lance emblem on their knight suit in honour of Nathaniel 
and in the great jousting tournament in the field of Adamantine, the Grand Master has the honour of wielding the very lance Nathaniel carried. When the factory world of Dracatoria was struck by a reality disjunction, tides of horrifying shadow spawn from the nether realm of Aldendrak in Camorra infested all of its cities. The world fell into darkness. Murderous mandrakes hunted the terrified populace, led by the fiendish Karundruk, the decapitator. Dracatoria's astropaths screamed their minds bloody in their cries for aid. Though it cost them their lives, their pleas were answered, with bastion ships of House Griffith arriving in orbit. Griffith Armigers swept through industrial ruins, banishing shadows with their hull looming and using their weapons to flush out Xenos packs into the line of fire of larger knights. Hissing mandrakes emerged impossibly within the cockpits of night suits, knifing screaming nobles to death in frenzies of violence. Victory was finally achieved when three dominus class knights forged a path to the shattered webway spa that began the madness and bombarded it. Realising their link to their realm was threatened, the shadow creatures fled. House Hawk Shroud no request for aid shall be denied. No house is more loyal to the Imperium than House Hawkshroud. Its mighty nobles always honour debts regardless of the cost or the odds. Valiant and steadfast all, they march out to war and lay down their lives to uphold past alliances, and their word is trusted to the end by those who fight beside them. Scions of House Hawkshroud have a very disciplined and virtue-focused upbringing, taught from a very young age to honour and respect their fellows. A mantra of the House is to repay debts tenfold. This gives them a zealous sense of honour, such that they almost never turn down a request for aid. As a result, they are well versed in fighting battles against the odds. This mentality stretches throughout every strata of society on their home world of Crystalen. Even for the peasants, their word is their bond. The house's strict code of honour often results in many of its knights being spread far and wide across the galaxy in support of those that have earned their loyalty and respect. Unlike many of the other knightly houses, Hawk Shroud Knights often sport campaign markings, army badges, space marine chapter symbols, regimental crests and other such emblems as a sign of respect for those they have sworn to aid in battle. This not only serves as a sign of dedication to the cause of their allies, but acts to strengthen the bonds of brotherhood between the knights and those that they fight alongside. Crestalan itself is an eerie haunted place with desolate moors and black hills that stretch in all directions under skies often heavy with ice-cold rain. Where most night worlds embrace a degree of technology, House Hawkshroud sees anything over and above what they need for continued operation as an unnecessary extravagance. Thus much of their world remains, in the eyes of observers, very primitive. Peasants and nobles alike live very much as they did 10,000 years ago or earlier. Now, the planet is ravaged by war following the orc invasion of War Zag Smasher. The house has sent out many calls for aid, desperately needing reinforcement. Though many have not responded, the knights of House Griffith, Astra Militarum regiments of Valhalla and Space Marines of the Valiant Blades are coming. Whether or not the planet can stand up to the Xenos hordes remains to be seen, but regardless, they will make the orcs suffer. Such is the unusually tight association between the knights of House Hawkshroud and their allies that it is not uncommon for a knight to remain on campaign far beyond the length of service that was initially offered or requested of them. In doing so, these knights are, in theory, walking the path of the Free Blade Knight, Unlike many free blades, however, these lone hawk shroud knights, or oaf sworn as they are often called, still display their house heraldry and livery. Unless they are slain in battle, these knights will one day seek to return to their homeworld, 
where they will be welcomed back and honoured. One oath-sworn is Lady Aurea, the only survivor of a lance that raced to the Yazan sector to aid the White Scars against the Red Corsairs. To this day, she fights beside the sons of Chagoras. House Morton. In war, show no mercy. The knights of House Morton hail from Kimdaria, known also as the Black Planet, until M35, a mysterious nebula known as the Black Paul, hid the planet from the rest of the galaxy. It was only when this phenomenon uh, partially dissipated that the Imperium finally re-established contact. In the years before its reunification with the Imperium, the nobles of House Morton knew only Kim Daria, a world of eternal darkness and ink-black landscapes. It was inhabited by fell creatures who were well accustomed to the conditions. The nobles had the singular task of holding back the endless variety of predatory monsters who stalked the desolate mountains, forbidding coastlines, twisted forests and boggy moors. So central did this duty become to their identity, a stylized depiction of a tusk boar, one of Kimdaria's monstrous beasts, is included in the house crest to this day. House Morton's entire way of being was grown around surviving amongst its world's formidable environment. The nobles and peasants alike of Kimdaria are stern, hard and rugged. They cling to traditions, rituals and orders that have seen them through unimaginable trials and horrors. They know their lessons have been hard won and never gained without great loss of life. Thus they put little trust in experimentation or new ideas. On such a dangerous world, the house can ill afford the losses that testing innovative tactics would create. The nobles of House Morton put much stock in towering walls and heavy gates to hold the nocturnal monsters of their world back. The surface of Kimdaria is dotted with bastions of varying size, which serve both as immense fortifications armed to break direct orbital assault from off-world invaders, as well as relatively smaller patrol bases that serve as rallying points and places of refuge for peasants and nightly patrols alike. Kimdaria's principal fortress is Black Crag, and it is here that the High Monarch of House Morton has their seat of power. Other powerful fortifications include the Bleak Moat, which watches over the Dominus Rex archipelago. The Dim Wall holds back the tides of migratory sand sharks of the Wild Wind Desert, the Peak of Darkness stands atop one of Kimdaria's highest mountains, a statement from the house that no part of their planet is beyond their control. Umbral Keep and the Black Bastion lie at the heart of the Ictwist Forest, their knights making more watch patrols than any others. The Night Spire lies on an island in the Ruhart Sea, its enormous beacon helping prevent shipping moving through the most hazardous waters to avoid both coastal rocks and sea monsters. The nobles of House Morton are as grim and as taciturn as you would expect, uh, considering the horrors of Kimdaria. Over the centuries they have learned to be as accustomed to darkness as the fell creatures that they hunt, and just as fierce. That their traditional monstrous foes kill with claw, fang, tooth and talon, they too have embraced, fighting in close quarters. Few nobles of other households can match them with thunderstrike gauntlets or reaper chainswords. High King Geralt, perhaps due to his lofty station, Sir Geralt is dour, even by the standards of his house. Many, however, claim the reason for this is the throne mechanicum Geralt bonded with centuries ago, that of the Night Warden Pride of Black Crag. Tragedy haunts this ancient artefact the way fell beasts lurk within the dark forests of Kimdaria. Whatever dark whispers might fill Sir Geralt's mind, they do not seem to hamper his ability to rule over Kimdaria's people 
and lead House Morton's knights in battle, nor diminish the vehemence with which he destroys the enemy, blasting rockets into the distance, blazing away with his Avenger Gatling cannon, and smiting foes with his Thunderstrike gauntlet. Geralt steers the pride of Black Crag into the thick of the fighting, slaughtering all that fall under its shadow. House Terin Glory in Honour Hailing from the tropical world of Voltaris, the knights of House Terin can trace the existence of their line back 15,000 years in a history replete with tales of valour, strength and glory. Over the ages they have earned countless battle honours, and it is widely believed that no one knight house exemplifies proud martial tradition greater than they. House Terin derives its name from Maximilian Terin, the first ruler of Voltaris, which legends say was colonised early in the Age of Strife. The practices and culture that he instituted are still honoured today by his successors, and over time each generation has added to them, as they have achieved their own battlefield triumphs worthy of remembrance. It is believed that the reason why House Terran's heraldic colour is cobalt blue is because Voltaris's oceans were once that hue, though today they are green due to the reaction of algae to the system's twin suns. Voltaris lies on the eastern fringe. Its vast green oceans surround tropical islands the size of continents. Bat-winged monstrosities hunt beneath the jungle eaves, and giant amphibious predators that are similarly commonplace offer the knights ample opportunity to perfect their hunting skills. Over time, House Terin has amassed so many rituals and traditions that they have become as renowned for their laborious ceremonies as much as their magnificent battle skills. The daily intonation known as the Thousand Canticles of War Long Awaited is said to take three hours. It is joked by some of the House's observers that the tedium that these events cause in the nobles is a primary reason why they are so eager to leave Furion Peak, their primary fortress, and to go to war. Whatever the truth, when House Terran forged their alliance with the Imperium, they ensured that Voltaris's law was changed, so that any knight under arms in service of the Emperor was exempt from ceremonial obligations. After that, the knights of House Terran sought out conflict across the galaxy, pursuing foes with an aggression born of years of unrequited yearning for war. Now, once a Terran noble has completed the ritual of becoming, they will join one of the Imperium's military campaigns as soon as possible, returning only rarely to their homeworld in order to show fealty and ensure the continuation of their line. Just as their rituals and ceremonies have evolved and grown over time, so has House Terin's crest. The emblem is that of a white stallion's head emblazoned upon a field of blue. As a member of an Equestor Imperialis house, Terin's knights bear a demi aquila as part of their crest, emblazoned upon red, representing the blood they have given in honour of the emperor. At the time of the house's founding, however, the crest was merely a blue, tilting shield with a stallion's head. It is believed that this symbol was chosen by Maximilian Terin after he had mysterious visions of a white stallion. Millennia later, Lord Brutus Terin led a victorious campaign against a monster the annals of history record as the Great Croctar at the Battle of the Six Swords. After this, the crest was expanded to include six blades pointing inwards towards the tilting shield. It was Brutus's descendant, Sortonius Thucydides Tyrin, who made the crest what it is today, after he swore allegiance to the emperor. House Terran knights utilise all manner of different iconography and symbols on the armour of their knight suits. Many frequently repeat the icon of the white stallion's head. Battle honours, campaign badges and kill markings are common sights. Family lineage is indicated using patterns and crests, in particular on their pauldrons and polyons. Uh, there are also more bespoke symbols. 
To earn the right to display blue and red stripes on weapon arms requires the noble to single-handedly slay a Titan-class foe. The Golden Arrow is the highest honour awarded to House Terran Knights for fighting prowess. A noble with this award displays it proudly on their armour and is regarded as a hero by their fellows. In recent centuries, the knights of House Terran have been forced to fight ever closer to home, despite a desire to fight further afield as they have done throughout the ages. The dual threats posed by High Fleet Leviathan and the rapidly expanding Tau Empire has ensured that Terran's knights remain on a constant war footing, lest Voltaris itself be threatened. This has proven to be of enormous benefit to the house. Since the emergence of the Great Rift, silvered automatons of the Necrons have risen from within Voltaris's once tranquil lakes. As a result, Patriarch Tybalt, High King of House Terran, has recalled numerous lances back to the homeworld to eliminate the Necron legions that threaten it. A veteran of many wars, Tybalt has defeated not only a Tau invasion of Voltaris in the past, uh, but one from the Aldari craft world of Alatok. He is committed to vanquishing the Necrons, just as he has broken other Xenos before. He will fight to the death to protect his home. Free Blades or Lone Knights Some nobles forsake their lineage to quest alone amongst the stars, are cast out as exiles or are the lone survivors of their houses. Such warriors are known as Free Blades and must carve out their own path to glory. Many quickly meet their end upon a battlefield far from home and kin, their past deeds buried with them, yet some prove themselves worthy of legend. There is no one reason a knight might become a free blade. Nobles who dishonour themselves may be banished from their household, or else decide themselves that they cannot remain. Some free blades are forged by force of circumstance, Perhaps they were left stranded far from home, and have fought for so long across the stars that solitude is all they know now. In other cases, entire knightly houses are destroyed, leaving a surviving noble to fight on for vengeance alone. So do lone knights set off into the vast void of space. Some quest for a worthy cause to uphold. Others search out a great wrong that they might set right. Rarely, free blades will become reclusive, willing to fight only to protect their hermitage, while others may yet be driven mad by their isolation or the circumstances of their exile, becoming murderous destroyers or silent avengers, more akin to supernatural beings than the proud warriors they once were. Whatever the case, free blade nobles become ever more bonded to their knight suit, human and machine living as one. Eventually, many become known only by the name of their knight suit, as though the warrior inside is no longer a separate entity. Three blade knights tend to travel alone, or with only a small group of retainers. Often these bondsmen, who fought loyally beside a noble while they were still part of a household, will continue to do so after their master becomes a free blade. their armigers supporting the larger knights as they did in the past. It is also not uncommon for free blades to band together, perhaps having been drawn to the same war zone during campaigns, forming lances that fight in much the same manner as a household detachment. After achieving victory, such free blade groups typically disperse once more, although a few have been known to remain in each other's company for extended periods of time. Regardless of their past tragedies or present company, and irrespective of the idiosyncrasies, they developed after so long away from hearth and home, free blades still place great significance on acts of honour and duty, perhaps even more so than in their previous lives. Thus, wherever their travels may take them, the free blade knights will fight to protect the people of the Imperium and punish the foes of mankind. The following are a selection of some of the more well-known Imperial Freeblade Knights. Kalena Maxis, the Stormwalker. When the Great Rift tore its way across the galaxy, the night world of Camador lay directly in its path. Engulfed by the billowing madness of the Maelstrom, the planet was beset by tides of mutants, heretic Astartes, 
and demonic abominations. Led by the garishly grotesque warriors of the Emperor's children, the Chaos Hordes tore down the strongholds of one noble house after another. Though the knights of Camador fought ferociously to defend their world, in the end they could not prevail. A single noble escaped the devastation, Lady Kalana Maxis, the Stormwalker. Kalana did not willingly flee the death of Camador, rather she was commanded by High King Arturo uh, to spread the word of her world's fall and to exact revenge unending upon the forces of chaos for their murderous deeds. This Lady Maxis has done with a burdened heart ever since. She haunts the fringes of the Great Rift, rallying Imperial forces wherever she finds them and leading them to fight back against the heretical foe. The arrival of the Stormwalker has turned the tide of many battles, Lady Maxis dedicating each hard-won victory to the memory of her slain kinsman. A Marathine As most free blades maintain no house markings, and few show any sign of Imperial or Adeptus Mechanicus alignment, it can be difficult to ascertain their past. The lone free blade known as a Marathine earned his name from the beleaguered Imperial defenders of Romaric Seven. Most believe the name is a reference to the knight's distinctive purple-red hull, but others claim it honours an Imperial saint. Silent and purposeful, the knight never replies to Hales, Vox transmissions or other attempts to converse with him. However, during the Tiberius Wars, it was observed that the knight complied with the Vox tactics of those he fought alongside, avoiding firing lines and vanquishing foes as per incoming requests. It led the defenders to believe that, though he did not speak, he was always listening. Only invitations to stay once the battle was won seemed to go unheeded. The Obsidian Knight Little is known about the free blade that some call the Obsidian Knight. The first recorded sighting came during the Damocles Gulf Crusade over 200 years ago. Out of nowhere strode the dark behemoth, covered in fell symbols. He single-handedly halted a major Tau assault and appeared in dozens of battles. The knight disappeared by campaign's end, remembered only in legend. Two centuries later, when the legendary Tau commander Shadow Sun launched her invasion of Agrelin, the Obsidian Knight appeared once again. Whether or not it was the same knight is unknown, but it fought with the same zeal, annihilating entire cadres of the enemy. Upon Perfectia, the Obsidian Knight stormed into battle against the largest battlesuits and artillery walkers the Tau Empire could deploy, scoring one engine kill after another before he was finally brought low and driven into a vast geothermic pit. The Imperium recovered the Obsidian Knight's wreckage, believing his legend done. Yet later in that same campaign, the Freeblade mysteriously returned to the fight, as vehement as ever. Garantius, the Green Knight Known as the Forgotten or Green Knight, Garantius resides at the centre of Sacred Mountain, a blessed peak that rises from the heart of Alaric Prime's largest island. There is rumoured to be a vault of archaeotech and lost lore there, over which he stands guard. Ancient and mysterious, Garantius has defended the vault and his world since time immemorial. Whenever the planet is threatened, the Green Knight will rise from his slumber and march upon the enemies of Alaric Prime. Rumours abound about the enigmatic figure, but the truth is that none know who or what the Green Knight is, as no one has ever spoken with the noble that pilots it, if indeed there is anything inside to reply to their hails. All that is certain is that in times of need the Green Knight arises to drive back the enemies of Alaric Prime with Reaper Chainsword and Thermal Cannon. Garantius was pivotal to the victory over the Orcs of the Red War and with cult uprisings occurring across Alaric Prime in the wake of the Great Rift, the Green Knight marches to battle once more. Manifest Vengeance Once this dogged Freeblade sets his mind to the hunt, no force in the galaxy can stop him. Manifest Vengeance has tracked foes across entire sectors of the galaxy, 
in order to land a killing blow with his chain cleaver. Auric or Agnus. Wielding blade and battle cannon, the knight known as Auric Arachnus fights against the Imperium's foes. With its distinctive bright yellow livery and contrasting stylized arachnid symbol, the bold free blade is designed to draw attention and the enemy's fire. From whence the knight came there is no clue, nor does its pilot ever emerge. When the shadow of High Fleet Behemoth fell across the Ultima Segmentum, however, the legend of Auric Arachnus began. As Imperial armies rallied to repel the foe, the Knight Paladin was a tower of firepower, and when eventually overrun, its reaper blade scythed down swarms of foes. As the Tyranids pressed in upon the Ultramarines, the chapter was forced back to its homeworld, and Auric Arachnus travelled with them. There the free blade earned great renown by slaying a dominatrix. The White Warden Once, the noble Neru de Gallio was the ruler of House de Gallio. His knight, the White Warden, was a symbol of the power and influence of his extended family. All that was lost when the Red War descended upon his planet. As the most powerful knightly house on Alaric Prime, it fell to de Gallio to weather the brunt of the fighting, and of all the house's nobles, Nero alone survived the fierce fighting. In the wake of this Pyrrhic victory, the lord of House de Gallio found himself made a scapegoat by lesser houses seeking political gains. After the mysterious disappearance of his consort, Nero turned Freeblade, taking the name of his knight and leaving Alaric Prime far behind. Since then, the White Warden has fought countless enemies of the Imperium, each time proving himself a superlative warrior and tactician. He has forged a strong bond with the courageous space marines of the Salamanders chapter, in whom de Gallio discovered a kindred desire to defend the common folk of the Emperor's realm. Since the opening of the Great Rift, the White Warden has risked his life repeatedly in defence of the Salamanders' homeworld of Nocturne. There are uncounted free blades at work within the Imperium. One of the most well-known is Canis Rex, or the Dog King, which doesn't have quite the same ring to it in Low Gothic, does it? Anyway, Sir Hector, a free blade and pilot of the knight suit Canis Rex, as I say, Dog King, is a gruff old noble. Wise, courageous and dutiful, he is a warrior of formidable mental strength as well of immense battlefield skill. He is the saviour of countless souls bound to slavery and the death of countless followers of chaos. The Iron Warrior's siege of the night world of Rendorian Alpha was long and brutal. The ruling House Cerberan uh, fought fiercely against the traitors, Yet for all their efforts, they were defeated and the survivors taken into captivity. In his enslavement, Sir Hector prayed to the Emperor each day and tried desperately to maintain the morale of his comrades as they were tortured. Despite his efforts, soon he was the only noble yet to be broken by the Iron Warriors. There is no known true explanation for what happened next. Some argue the Emperor sent Sir Hector a miracle. Others say the bond between him and his knight was incredibly strong. Either way, Canis Rex broke free of its own chains and came to its pilot's rescue. From then on, Sir Hector, now a free blade as the last of his house, led the Rondorian resistance. He freed several of his household's living servants, helping them to escape, earning him the epitaph of Chain Breaker. Despite his successes, he knew his world was lost. Capturing a vessel, he and his remaining loyal followers escaped. Ever since, he has fought to slay the followers of Chaos wherever he has found them, and liberate those they have enslaved. Alas, this is not all that can be said of knights, for the Imperium is beset by their dark mirror, the Chaos Knights. Chaos Knights tower over the battlefield, each a god of war wrought in iron. Piloted by nobles who have forsworn their allegiance to the Imperium, these bipedal engines of destruction are amongst the most fearsome creatures in the galaxy. 
The dread roar of tortured engines and warp-infused macro servos precedes the coming of the Chaos Knights. With vast strides, the gargantuan machines draw ever closer to their quarry, their trudging footfalls sending quakes through the shattered earth. Long shadows extend before them, shrouding their enemies in darkness, whilst suffocating plumes of plasmic exhaust pour down from more-like vents in their carapace. Those marked for death by the knights are gripped by the inescapable truth that their doom approaches, and, as they open fire upon the towering machines, the last of their hope evaporates. Flickering ion shields absorb the incoming fire, energy blasts dissipating and artillery shells exploding harmlessly before they can strike their targets. Undaunted, the knights continue their ominous march, their bristling weapon systems grind into firing positions and, with thunderous cracks, they unleash annihilation upon the foe. Enormous melter weapons shoot beams of searing heat that erupt into fiery novas, immolating infantry and reducing armoured vehicles to bubbling slag. Monstrous battle cannons rain hails of explosive shells upon the foe, detonating with enough force to crack open a ferrocrete bunker. Rockets and missiles streak through the skies towards the most threatening opponents, annihilating these priority targets with punishing swiftness. Those enemies, not instantly obliterated by the opening barrage, are cut down by blinding bursts of laser weaponry or atomized by the knight's plasma-fueled armaments. As the survivors desperately seek to hold the line, the knights fire streams of solid shot that tear through flesh and armour, leaving only shredded corpses and a thick crimson mist where soldiers once rallied. Those who do not flee at the titanic machine's approach are blasted apart at close range, immolated by jets of burning promethium, or simply ground to pulp beneath immense taloned feet. Looming over their enemies, the knights swing their colossal chainswords in reaping arcs. Jagged adamantine teeth soar through tank hulls with contemptuous ease and liquefy the hapless crews inside. Now the knights use a warp strike claw to pulverize their foes, crushing war machines to scrap with their obliterating grip or using the energy-reeved fists like wrecking balls to batter aside all resistance. Each Chaos Knight is an unhallowed relic of humanity's ancient past. They are twisted reflections of the Imperial Knights, corrupted in form and spirit by fell sorceries, dark worship, and malefic re-engineering. The knight suits were first created using standard template constructs during the Dark Age of Technology, and some have survived through the innumerable wars that have characterised the long millennia since. For generations uncounted, the colossal war machines have been piloted by nobles. These aristocratic warriors are possessed of enough physical, mental and spiritual fortitude to survive the ritual of becoming, commune with the throne mechanicum at each war machine's heart and thus bond with their night suit. In the case of Chaos Knights, such rituals are tainted by warp entities, malefic sorceries, and the perversions of the nobles themselves. At first, the knight may appear unchanged, but in its core, the irrevocable process of rot has already begun. Over years, or even centuries, Chaos energies seep into the war engine, torturing its machine spirit and mutating its mechanical form. Where once the suit and its pilot were a gleaming beacon of imperial honour, the Chaos Knight and its fallen noble now comprise a symbiotic beast of unfettered wrath and base hatred. A single Chaos Knight has as much resilience and firepower as a small army. Those that have turned upon or even butchered the rest of their knightly households are termed dreadblades by the Ordo Hereticus. They typically operate as lone wolves and mercenaries, lending their immense might to heretical warlords in exchange for relics, arcane knowledge, or fife planets upon which they can enact their cruelties. Dreadblades are often followed into battle by hordes of warriors, 
Chaos space marines who revere the night's destructive potential and throngs of cultists who worship the machines as manifestations of the Dark God's will. How low have these space marines fallen to worship a mortal like this? At other times, mortal dreadblades will gather together, focusing their disparate fury towards a single purpose. Even more terrifying than the individualistic dreadblades are the night houses that have fallen in their entirety to chaos. Those that have sided with traitor titan legions and the dark mechanicum are known as infernal houses and use techno sorcery and demonic entities uh, to bolster the capabilities of their night suits. Other knightly courts, known as iconoclast houses, have more varied heretical allegiances. Some have renounced their allegiance to the Imperium in order to maintain oaths of fealty to heretic Astartes legions or the Dark Gods themselves, whereas others have done so to carve out their own dread empires. To maintain the integrity of their Chaos Knight suits through countless brutal wars, fallen nobles rely on artisans known as idolaters, like those whom they serve, idolaters are an apparent offshoot of peoples loyal to the Imperium. Where the sacristan orders are trained by the Adeptus Mechanicus, inducted into the holy mysteries of the Omnisire so that they might minister to the knights of the noble houses, idolaters learn their craft within the screaming soul forges of the Dark Mechanicum. Through diabolical rituals, they entreat the entities that dwell within the warp, sacrificing living victims and mighty machines on great cog-shaped altars. Using such practices, they glean knowledge of how Chaos Knights function, and more importantly, they learn how to desecrate the ostensibly incorruptible technologies of the throne's mechanicum. Often, there will be multiple cabals of idolaters dwelling on each Chaos Knight world, each with the ability to repair battle damage sustained by the mechanical suits. The power of these cabals waxes and wanes with the services they can provide to the fallen household. Some know the secrets to perform uh, mecha-inductive rituals that would vastly augment a prominent knight's power. Others may be able to subjugate their liege nobles' rivals through the installation of psychic yokes and spiritual shackles. Then there are those idolaters who have learned the sorcerous ways of the warp and can provide glimpses of the future so that a despotic Chaos Knight can better direct their next campaign of terror. Competition between cabals is encouraged by the nobility and war is common between opposing groups of idolaters. Should a cabal fall out of favour with the nobles they serve, their flayed corpses may be used to decorate the fallen household's night suits. However, such actions are not taken lightly. To incur the ire of the idolaters is to invite a nightmarish demise. Many a fallen noble who has slaughtered an idolater has subsequently been devoured by their own night suit, or has had their soul ripped to pieces by warp surge within their thrown mechanicum. The most cunning nobles ensure that the idolaters in their service have some other target upon whom such malice is likely to fall. Millennia ago, the Great Crusade saw worlds across the length and breadth of the galaxy brought under the Emperor's almighty rule. But at its zenith, the Imperium was shattered by treachery. War Master Horus and half of the Space Marine Legions succumbed to the corruptions of the warp and, in the name of the Dark Gods, launched an apocalyptic campaign against the Imperium. The galaxy was riven by civil war. The Legionis Astartes slaughtered their erstwhile allies, worlds were incinerated by teeming armies of heretics, and the light of hope, carried forth by the Emperor, was replaced by bitter darkness. It was during this time that the first knights fell to chaos. Many amongst the Imperium had thought it impossible for the noble houses to be corrupted. The throne's mechanicum to which they were bonded altered the noble psyches and synaptic makeups, conditioning them against harbouring thoughts of betrayal or sedition. Indeed, the majority of the night worlds fought aggressively to stem the tide of heresy, putting down any rebellious elements within their own societies before joining in the wider battle alongside the loyalist space marine legions. Due to their sheer power and unflagging loyalty, 
The knights were crucial to the imperial war effort on countless bloody battlefields. Yet it was this same loyalty that led some to side with the arch enemy. Innumerable Mechanicum forge worlds sided with Horus, as did many of the night houses that had sworn undying fealty to the tech priests of those worlds. As the Dark Mechanicum delved deeper into the arts of profane techno sorcery, so too were the knights in their service tainted by chaos. Rune marked knights marched to war alongside traitor Titan legions, unleashing devastation upon the defenders of the Imperium. Other fallen households upheld their oaths to Space Marine legions that turned traitor. The nobles of these houses followed their own codes of conduct to the letter, serving without question and answering all calls to war, and in doing so, placed themselves on the path to damnation. Other knights turned upon their own houses and renounced all ties to their bloodlines, swayed by the whispering of malefic entities in their dreams or bound to the will of the dark gods through sorcerous rituals. Thus were the Chaos Knights born, and, in the hundred centuries since, they have continued to spread death and terror throughout the stars. For a noble to bond with their throne mechanicum is a harrowing process. Only the most worthy individuals, women and men, possessed of formidable physical, mental and spiritual strength, are able to survive the ritual of becoming. Those who do are forever changed. In the fastness of each noble house, there is a sacred room known as the Chamber of Echoes. Within the Chamber of Echoes, the would-be pilot is wired into a throne mechanicum and left in isolation so that their worth may be judged. Residing inside the throne mechanicum are the geist-like echoes of each of its former occupants. Every one of these electro-spirits was once a noble, and it is they who assess the new supplicant's worth. Coursing through the neural sockets directly into the noble's mind, they are able to pry open the supplicant's innermost thoughts and closely guarded secrets. The ritual lasts long and terrible hours, and those nobles who are found wanting are utterly consumed by the process. Those who are deemed worthy are bonded eternally with the throne mechanicum, and with their forebears who dwell inside it. The ritual of becoming is not only the means by which a noble becomes a pilot, it is a necessary defence against corruption. A throne mechanicum is a shield to prevent the awesome power of a knight from being wielded by one capable of treachery. From the moment they become, a pilot's thoughts are influenced by their throne, even when they do not sit in it. Notions of fealty, obligation and hierarchy are emblazoned at the forefront of the pilot's mind, as is a deep and undivided respect for the nobles' ancestors and their household traditions. Such conditioning should make treachery impossible, but the will of the dark gods is strong, and their corruption truly insidious. Knights have continued to fall to chaos in the millennia since the Horus Heresy. Surviving knights, returning battered from long crusades, have brought more than tales of heroism back with them. Decades of slaughter against enemies steeped in the stuff of the warp can erode the resolve of even the most stoic noble. The corruption of chaos working its way into their mind through the connection of the throne mechanicum. Night worlds, Lying on the edges of raging empiric storms have been inexorably transformed by the outflow of raw warp energy. On more than one occasion, such a planet has been enveloped entirely by a nightmarish tempest only to later re-emerge, its population devoured by demons and its war engines hideously transfigured. Other knights have slowly succumbed to corruption over the long campaigns they have fought on the side of the Imperium. After butchering endless tides of frenzied heretics for centuries without rest, the pursuit of carnage can become synonymous with duty. This is especially true for those knights fighting in isolation from their household kin, or in war zones where reality is distorted by the dread influence of the warp. Caked in the blood of a thousand conflicts and faced with horror in every direction, the mechanised warriors lose the ability to differentiate between ally and enemy. Even the spectral gestalt of their throne mechanicum becomes blinded by the need to kill, 
not caring who or what is the focus of the knight's destructive fury. Several knights thought lost in battle have later been discovered to have fallen and to have continued their slaughters unabated. As the night houses became ever more corrupted, so too were their worlds transformed into horrific mockeries of their former glory, where once the denizens of these planets had looked to their nobles for leadership and protection, now they were reduced to a terror-filled existence. The populations of entire cities were hunted for sport by their knightly overlords. Fallen nobles supplied tithes of living humans to their heretical lieges to be used in sadistic rituals or in the forging of demonic pacts. Where once the would-be knight pilot approved their worth in solemn duels, they now engaged in competitive slaughters of their own subjects. Depraved cultures took root in every echelon of society on these chaos night worlds. Teeming cults worshipped the dark gods openly. Fallen nobles competed to raise the greatest fanes to the ruinous powers. Their landscapes became pocked with charnel pits that overflowed with the corpses of defeated enemies. These planets that had been bastions of order throughout the Age of Strife metamorphosed into deep wells of anarchy from which the taint of chaos seeped into reality. Iconoclast Houses Iconoclast houses are defined by the malice and madness that led to their corruption. In place of honour, they pursue only conquest, destroying whatever enemies stand before them to expand their tyrannical domains. Many have long histories of depravity that stretch back for thousands of years, though new iconoclast houses can be formed wherever the taint of the warp takes hold. The pilots of the first iconoclast households had already become before the Horus heresy. The enormity of the Imperium's fracturing had devastating effects on those knights' households whose allegiances lay with the traitors. As the heretical war spread across the galaxy, the ghosts within hundreds of Throne's Mechanicum howled in anguish. Their imprinted spirits were tortured by the impossibility of upholding their honour and maintaining their loyalty in the face of their traitor master's deeds of betrayal. The neural outcry was such that some nobles were driven insane by it, while others suffered gruesome cranial hemorrhages. Others still continued blindly into damnation, claimed by that most insidious trap of believing honestly that those to whom they had sworn their oaths fought for a just cause. The vast majority of turncoat nobles were subjected to immense torments. They were ceaselessly assaulted by feelings of shame and hatred, their every negative emotion amplified and echoed by the ancestral spirits of their throne's mechanicum. According to the Code Chivalric, failure to perform one's duties is a transgression that can only be absolved through selfless service. As such, these knights fought all the harder for their treacherous lieges, at the commands of their heretical lords, lances of chaos knights tore bloody paths through the Imperium's armies. Once honourable nobles led attacks to desecrate cities and enslave the populations of entire planets. Miles-high statues dedicated to the Emperor were toppled by knights' ceaseless bombardments and, in their place, profane monuments were erected to glorify the cruelties of the Dark Gods. These attempts to quell their self-loathing through unquestioning service only added fuel to the fire. The knights were compelled towards greater extremes of brutality and further depths of depravity, and, with every debased action, the screams of their throne mechanicum grew louder. Over time, the Chaos Knights became unrecognisable as the valiant warriors they once were, as some had transformed into incarnations of carnage. They hacked their way through the steel and flesh of their foes, seeking to drown their unrelenting anguish in oceans of blood. Others became agents of instability, their motivations and allegiances upended constantly by the hateful tempests that raged in their souls. The insanity that festered inside each chaos night corroded their notions of chivalry, twisting concepts of honour and duty into new and nightmarish ideals. 
These fallen knights justified the most heinous atrocities they committed, reasonings that since they had been bred to be the exemplars of virtue, every action they took must therefore be virtuous. Whilst incinerating the defenders of an imperial bastion, a knight would conclude that such measures must be necessary, for otherwise their codes of virtue would not allow them to immolate their victims. Interesting. And by the same grotesque logic, if roasting alive a hundred imperial soldiers was an act of honour, then there could be no greater honour than seeing the entire galaxy set ablaze. Since the Horus heresy, thousands of individual knights and even whole knightly households have fallen to chaos. Each instance of treachery is a monumental blow to the Imperium. The nobles and their knight suits are not only crucial cogs in humanity's war machine, they are considered to be amongst the most unshakably loyal servants of the Emperor. The mere suggestion that a noble could forswear their oaths and fight against the Imperium's servants is tantamount to blasphemy. It is whispered that the Departmento Munitorum has had imperial officers executed for heresy rather than lend credence to their claims, that they have done battle with turncoat nobles. Yet the terrifying reality is that chaos knights bent on anarchy and slaughter march upon the Emperor's realm in ever greater numbers. Chaos knights are able to cover enormous distances when battling across a planet, marching unhindered through toxic atmospheres and over irradiated continents to reach their enemies. When their wars stretch beyond a single world, many of their kind use corrupted explorator craft and mass conveyance barges to transport themselves to the front lines. On the most warp-drenched battlefields, the horrific war engines have been known to storm forth from empiric tears in reality. Streamers of sickening warp stuff cling to their brutal forms like fluttering pennants, as they unleash fusillades of monstrous firepower, tearing enemy squads apart. Fallen nobles embark on campaigns of destruction for many reasons. Some do so to conquer territory in the name of the baleful deities they worship. Others have sworn fealty to the Dark Mechanicum, the heretic Astartes, or powerful demonic entities. Others still are driven by insanity and profane visions, launching quests to upend the very fabric of existence and transform the galaxy into a twisted hellscape. The tortures endured by each Chaos Knight pilot serve to permanently corrupt their throne mechanicum. Upon their death, the imprinted remnants of a fallen noble remain in their throne, where their twisted visions of virtue spread to the other spectral echoes like a rampant infection. No longer will the throne serve to shield the pilot from corruption. It now feeds the depraved desires of those who would bond with it. Bloodlust, sadism and psychosis were fostered in the lines of fallen nobles that flowered from the first chaos nights, giving rise to the tyrannical warlords of the early iconoclast houses. Lurking behind the skin of reality lies a realm of infinite energy, emotion and possibility, known as the warp. It is a hellish dimension where the passions, hatreds, desires and fears of the galaxy's peoples coalesce into monstrous entities. These are the four chaos gods, Corn, the blood god, patron of warriors and murderers, font of infinite rage, Zench, the changer of the ways, master of fate, sorcery and mutation, Nurgle, the plague lord, the bloated and ebullient deity of disease, Slanesh, the dark prince, the ultimate expression of hedonism, vanity and obsession. It is from the stuff of these abhorrent beings that the demons of chaos flow, and it is to their cruel wills that those entities are enslaved, as are countless damned mortals. Lurking beyond the veil, the chaos gods war ceaselessly with one another and with the denizens of real space, their demonic foot soldiers surging through wherever a warp storm or empiric breach forms. Many fallen nobles have been seduced by the poisoned promises of the Chaos Gods, just as the traitor legions were before them. 
In some cases, entire iconoclast or infernal houses devote themselves to a single deity. They daub that god's sigil upon their night suits, raise profane temples and idols to their chosen patron, and dedicate the souls of those they slaughter to their masters in the warp. Others are pantheistic in their worship, with individual fallen nobles choosing different patron gods to the remainder of the household, or offering dark prayers to whichever deity they believe will aid them in any given moment. The chaos gods are vast entities whose gaze spans all of time and space, and to catch their fleeting regard for even an instant requires deeds so ghastly that they will stain their perpetrator's soul forevermore. Yet, for those damned few who earn the gods' blessings, the rewards can be great. Gifts of earthly power are granted to those who sell their eternal soul to the chaos gods, from flourishing psychic abilities to boons of physical might or unholy fortitude. At times, even the sudden conjuration of demonic armies to fight alongside the chosen noble. The Infernal Houses Through close ties with the Dark Mechanicum, the Infernal Houses find ever more twisted ways to warp their weapons and machinery. In brutal campaigns, they strip worlds of their material resources and enslave entire populations, funneling their plunder into nightmarish rituals to infuse their night suits with the power of chaos. Not all knights fell to chaos in the same manner as those of the iconoclast houses. Those whose pilots had sworn allegiance to the heretics of the Dark Mechanicum were the subjects of countless dread rituals, each designed to corrupt the supposedly incorruptible technologies of the Throne Mechanicum. The true knowledge of how the thrones functioned was beyond the ken of even the most ancient magi, uh, but the colossal military potential of the knights spurred them to conduct ever more depraved experiments. The traitor magi of the Dark Mechanicum emerged millennia ago from a schism among the tech priests. Amongst the myriad organisations that made up the Great Crusade, it was the Mechanicum of Mars that was most successful in securing oaths of fealty from the night houses. The Martian tech priests coveted the ancient archaeotech that they possessed, and were eager to exploit the rich mineral wealth of the various night worlds. In return, the sacristan orders who tended to the knights were inducted into the confidence of the Omnisire, regaining many lost secrets of mechanical artifice that allowed them to better serve their masters. From the ashes of the Horus heresy, loyalist tech priests emerged as the Adeptus Mechanicus. The heretics of the Dark Mechanicum, however, fell deeper into unholy techno-sorcery, taking the houses that had sided with them down a dark path indeed. On hellish forge worlds, the Dark Magi created their own grim simulacra, simulacra <laughs> of the Chamber of Echoes. Into these screaming oubliettes, they dragged the throne's mechanicum from captured night suits, often with the broken and bloodied pilots still attached. Many of these chambers were lined with arcane devices that were used to bombard the captive thrones with focused warp energy. Others bristled with mechadendretic tentacles that parasitically fused themselves to the throne. Through them, demonic entities were able to surge into the host tissue of the neurally wired pilot. Certain sects of the Dark Mechanicum raised base warrior champions who fought one another for the right to bond with a night suit. These individuals were not trained in the ways of the noble households, but the prospect of piloting blinded them to the dangers of attempting to become. The results of these procedures were ubiquitously gruesome, but amidst the tortured cries, the explosions of flesh and the scrap code howls of the tainted thrones, the Magi of the Dark Mechanicum gleaned volumes of morbid data. Arcane procedures were devised to scramble the geists that dwelt within each throne. Spectrophagic demons were summoned to devour the spirit echoes of pilots past. 
The Thrones Mechanicum and the Knight Suits themselves were seeded with pathogenic scrap code, and in some rare cases, the Magi used their technologies to open interstitial warp rifts inside the ancient circuitry clusters. Though only a fraction of the Knight Suits and Thrones that were captured survived these torturous experiments, those that did were corrupted beyond redemption, as were any pilots unfortunate enough to survive. Through unspeakable procedures, the Dark Mechanicum bonded these fallen nobles to their tainted war engines, thus creating the progenitors of the Infernal Houses. Chaos corruption seeded into the Throne Mechanicum spread into the rest of the night like rot. The night's massive actuators, the hissing capacitors of its baleful weapons and its red-hot reactor core are bent to the insane will of the pilot and the spectral inhabitants of the throne. No longer does the war engine march with bold and purposeful strides, with every colossal movement being the result of generations of discipline and training within the noble households. Instead, the chaos knight lopes forward with predatory haste, eager to drink in the depths of its next band of foes. Gone is the imperative desire to protect its allies, to form the immovable centre of a defensive line or the unstoppable point of a combined charge. The Chaos Knight's machine spirit cares nothing for those alongside whom it fights. Whether they live or die is of little concern, so long as it can engage in rampant slaughter. If a loyalist knight is akin to its noble's valiant steed, Chaos Knight's are closer to rabid warhounds. A fallen pilot fights constantly to retain dominance over their hate-filled war engine and force it to obey their will. It is a fight from which not all fallen nobles emerge victorious. Drooling blood or acidic oils, ocular lenses burning with murder lust, and hulls wreathed in miasmal fumes or crackling hellfires, it is clear to all who look upon Chaos Knights that whatever nobility resided within these deranged war engines, it has long soured into hate and madness. Dread Blades Not all fallen nobles offer fealty or suffer bonded servitude to a dread household. Dread Blades call no one master. These lone knights are perhaps the most dangerous, for their obsessions, insanities, and whims are given free rein. They bestride the galaxy as questing despots, fulfilling their cruelest desires while descending into damnation. The horrors that cause a knight to become a dreadblade are as varied as the currents of chaos themselves. Some fallen nobles are led onto this path of damnation through illusion and trickery. Others find themselves exiled as a result of their growing insanity, or some grievous contravention of their house's twisted honour codes. Others still choose violent solitude of their own volition, as a means to pursue revenge and to fulfil their sworn oaths of murder. Regardless of the underlying reason, a fallen noble who turns their back on the Imperium and their household is forever outcast, yet this only makes them more deadly. Freed from the bonds of fealty and subservience, there is nothing to stop a dreadblade from pursuing their own nightmarish desires. They may travel from war zone to war zone to slack their, and, let's be honest, their iron steeds lust for carnage, or hunt down and destroy all in the galaxy who have offended their twisted dignity. A great many dreadblades hail from houses that are still loyal to the Imperium and the Omnisire. During the Horus heresy, when the rest of the household sided with the loyalists, individual knights felt honour-bound to maintain their fealty to the traitors. Countless such schisms occurred across the galaxy, and though many of the rebelling knights were permanently silenced in titanic duels, others disappeared into the stars only to re-emerge alongside the armies of the War Master. Many more nobles have fallen in the millennia since. Some were driven insane by the debilitating touch of fell Xenos weaponry or sorcery. Others were compelled towards an existence of indiscriminate slaughter 
by corrosive nanophages eating into their throne, made susceptible to demonic influence by empiric energies. Others still become embittered by their treatment at the hands of former brother and sister lords, ravaged by hardships endured in a life of exile before their house, until, at last, the wound to their honour becomes so great they take up the mantle of Dreadblade. Other knights who become Dreadblades are those captured in battle, their allies wiped out and their suits damaged to the point that they can no longer fight. A horrific fate awaits these warriors. Their minds and souls are gradually eroded through the use of sorcerous torture and demonic ritual. Notions of loyalty and honour are replaced with the depraved ideals of their captors and a screaming desire for carnage. The dread households of chaos themselves have also spawned numerous lone destroyers. Some of these traitor lineages have met their doom in battle, or were besieged within their keeps over the millennia, whether by imperial xenos or rival heretics, and only individual survivors have escaped their houses' fall. Splinterheart of House Yerin, the skin flayer of House Porvix, and Prince Rekard, Vor Kinser, ruler of his line, are known to have escaped the destruction of their world and house. They and others roam the most dangerous warp channels of the galaxy, preying upon isolated outposts and selling their immense power to traitors, heretics and apostates. None in their number cared about the diabolical deeds they now commit, or who falls beneath their blades. There are then those dreadblades who, over the course of long and bloody campaigns, have lost the ability to perceive the path of righteousness, Surrounded by so much slaughter, their only notions of honour are tied to the killing strike of their blade, or the obliterative blast of their battle cannon. Many such dread blades are completely unaware that they have fallen from grace, their single-mindedness binding them to the atrocities that they so wantonly commit. A dynastic strife within dread households can also result in the banishment of knights, or in them abandoning their former kin. Savage power struggles fought between rival heirs to a specific lineage's crown are waged not only through assassination, political manoeuvring and attempted coups, but also in open combat between individual knights. A failure in such bouts often means death. For those that escape, a lifetime of hatred, bitterness and the need for revenge awaits them as they forge their path anew and alone. Wars can easily break out between different lines of a house, as competing factions vie for control of the entire dynasty. Such conflicts are common, but are usually swiftly and brutally put down by the house's ruler. They may start out of simple greed. The ruler's perceived weakness or the desire for personal power and glory, or to win greater favour with the dark gods. Those branches who choose sides poorly, if they are not forcibly dominated or slain by the victors, sometimes fracture into self-serving retinues, each dreadblade blaming the other for their family's loss of prestige and power. Wars may be ignited by clashes of ideology, fuelled by cults growing among the fallen nobles, dedicated to one of the dark gods, or by outside forces seeking influence among the Chaos Knights, and seeding distrust and revolt between them. As an example, at Orvesta, rival groups within House Thuringis each sought to broker alliances that would advantage the whole house and bring no small amount of prestige to themselves. The Iron Warriors Traitor Legion and the Dark Mechanicum of Buhula IV each sought to undermine the other's treaties with the Thuringis Knights, Nobles were murdered, envoy knights butchered and scrapped, and a civil war that threatened Thurungus' existence spiralled out of control. Eventually, the Dam Regis Lyda Thuringia ruthlessly crushed both competing factions within her court, sickened by their underhanded ways that had nearly torn her bloodline apart. Those she caught were ritually executed, while any conspirators who escaped were declared outcast and forbidden from ever re-entering the subsector on pain of death.
Over time, marching upon the path of the dread blade leads these fallen nobles and their chaos knights to become some of the strangest and most warped of all their kind. Some are reeved in supernatural phenomena, their carapaces dancing with dark flame, or surrounded by clouds of cackling demonic attendants. Others listen too closely to the whispers that infest their throne mechanicum, learning to wield unclean sorcery at the expense of their sanity, or becoming consumed by an obsessive need to dominate. Others still grow folds of sinew or great barbed tusks, becoming lurching horrors that meld warped flesh with twisted machinery. And perhaps one day, the night suit will consume its pilot. Body and soul. The following are some of the most well-known and most cursed nightly houses of chaos. House Lucaris. Strike first, strike often. Of all the iconoclast houses, there are none bolder nor more tenacious than House Lucaris. They have waged multiple barbaric campaigns against the Imperium, butchering those who fought in the Emperor's name in all corners of the galaxy. Over the course of ten thousand years, they have reaped a toll of carnage too high for any single scriptorium to record. In their devastating assaults, the knights of House Lucaris often strike on multiple fronts simultaneously, overwhelming even dug-in enemies with their speed and ferocity. In their wake, they leave maimed survivors to spread the fearsome tale of their coming as the knights themselves drive the attack forward. They have been called the House of Serpents, the Fanged Knights, and many other names, but are always synonymous with terror. Millennia ago, during the Great Crusade, dark histories tell that the Lunar Wolves arrived at the tempest-reeved world of Morda Prime, where they found the Knights of House Lucaris. The nobles of the household immediately swore allegiance to Horus, for in the War Master they saw manifested their own tenets of virtue through strength and mercy through dominance. They answered his calls to battle without question, employing thunderous assaults to crush all who dared oppose their liege's will. Even when Horus turned to chaos, the knights of Morda Prime held true to their vows of service. When the War Master was slain... House Lucaris swore an oath of undying enmity against the Emperor. They never pledged allegiance to the growing Black Legion, which emerged from those sons of Horus the knights saw as having abandoned their fallen Primarch. In the millennia since, House Lucaris have waged apocalyptic wars against both the Imperium and the heretic Astartes. House Lucaris comprises many factions led by the complex web of its noble lines, each straining to grow stronger than the others in power plays and supremacist schemes. Intrigues within the house's vying nobility help to foster and support cadet branches, whose hereditary members operate with cult-like secrecy. They ostensibly follow the code of unilateral supremacy for Lucaris, while secretly following their own ambitions. The fallen nobles, known as the Scions of Concordat, perpetuate a mythic history of Horus and view the War Master's legion and those of his brothers as traitors to his noble rule. Thus they actively seek out to crush warbands and strongholds of the heretic Astartes. The Black March, meanwhile, take deep satisfaction in visiting upon Imperial worlds horrific devastation, and in vengeance for what they see as acts of aggression by the Emperor. They claim to keep meticulous records of every deed of betrayal by the Imperium against their house, though none outside their ranks have seen them, and many of their own see justifications of their atrocities as unnecessary fabrications. While various competing rivalries simmer beneath the surface, open betrayal against House Lucaris is punished with swift and brutal vengeance. On the deaf world of Friggin's world, the Freeblade Knight Unflinching Steel aided the defenders of the planet's towering fortress, Gragan Keep. Once a sworn companion of House Lucaris, the noble piloting Unflinching Steel had abandoned them when they first turned traitor. 
A trio of Knights Rampager tore down the walls of Gragon Keep, allowing many other hate-filled war machines to pour through the bridge. Unflinching Steel was crippled and dismembered by those of its former house, but was not destroyed. The battered and mutilated chassis and the severely wounded fallen noble inside were taken back to Morda Prime to face judgment. It is said that through the strange science of House Lucarus's idolaters, the knight and noble's agonising penalty for treachery has so far lasted nigh on ten millennia. In more recent centuries, there have been accounts of House Lucarus marching alongside the Black Legion once more. At Rortus, lances of Chaos Knights bearing the House's serpentine heraldry tore through the defending Vestroyan armoured regiments with contemptuous ease, while Black Legionnaires penetrated the immortal city's innermost defences. Only the fallen nobles of Morda Prime and Abaddon himself know if this newfound alliance constitutes a reforging of their bonds of old. What seems clear to other houses of Chaos Knights is that House Lucarus's power was swelled under this apparent pact, and that the fanged knight's terrifying reputation is now more widespread and infamous than ever before. House Herpetrax We bow to none. House Herpetrax is an oddity amongst knight houses, in that its nobles never swore allegiance to the Imperium, they serve no master beyond their own keep, and instead prey upon any world within reach and any fleet that dares stray too near their homeworld. House Herpetrax's homeworld of Jadathra was not discovered by the Explorator fleets during the Great Crusade. The first record of Imperial contact dates to late M36, when the rogue trader Charis Drake was exploring a vast tract of space that had previously been isolated by warp vortexes. When envoys from Terra followed in Drake's footsteps, they were met with unequivocal and violent opposition by the knights of Herpetrax. The nobles scoffed at the prospect of aligning themselves to the Imperium. Envoys sent to Jadathra were executed and flayed, and it was upon the raw skins that the nobles penned their scathing refusals. It was from these grim missives that the Imperial agents were able to glean a portion of House Herpetrax's history. The Jadathans wrote that during the horrors of Old Night and the long millennia before, they had been approached many times by individuals claiming to be the Emperor of Mankind. None of these previous claimants had shown equal metal to the royal lines of Jadatha, and House Herpetrax were even less inclined to pledge themselves to one who sat as a corpse upon his throne. Heresy! They decried all claims of the Emperor's sovereignty over humanity, and in no uncertain terms, proclaimed that they would exterminate any who did not bow at their feet. The knightly household was immediately declared iconoclast, and a world-spanning siege was launched against Jadathra. Orbital bombardments were initiated against their keeps and castles, followed by ground-based assaults by Astra Militarum armoured and infantry regiments. But the Herpetrax knights proved dauntless. Fate also conspired to aid the nobles in defending their planet. Strange mutations quickly spread through the invading armies and warp vortexes closed in once more around the system. The final communique received by Imperial forces from Jadathra before the planet was again made unreachable, was sent by Charis Drake, as she attempted to escape the war zone. In this, she hinted at the vile history she had uncovered on the planet. There was evidence that the nobles had practised profane rituals and heretical sorceries for millennia. A century later, the knights of House Herpetrax marauded through the Kren worlds, spreading terror and leaving ruin in their wake. Stretching more than a hundred light years, the Kren worlds were a network of planetary systems serving as a vital manufactorum hub in the galactic south of the Ultima Segmentum. Despite concerted defence efforts by the Astra Militarum and Adeptus Mechanicus, the Herpetrax advance progressed with staggering speed. The denizens of worlds conquered by the iconoclast house were enslaved and put to work, excavating the foundations beneath the towering hive cities in which they lived. 
Billions died in the process, buried in catastrophic cave-ins or collapsing from starvation and exhaustion. On several planets, the fallen noble overlords uncovered what they were searching for. The forgotten remains of ancient long march ships were prized from the earth, remnants of failed human colonies from the dark age of technology. Whatever was unearthed, from dangerous archaeotech to apocalyptic weapons, was taken back to Jadrifthur, while the slave populations were exterminated by orbital bombardment. Over the course of a generation, the belt of imperial manufacturing worlds was transformed into a ruined and lifeless stretch known as the Krenskar. House Kaima. Through flame lies the path to victory. For ten thousand years, the knights of House Kaima have fought ferociously for the glory of the Imperium. The cracked and burning surface of their world, Sotir's Wake, was dotted with monolithic statues of the Emperor, towards which faithful serf classes of the planet prayed for hours every day. All that would change with the emergence of the Great Rift. Many times over the millennia had the nobles of Sotir's Wake answered the summons to join gathering Imperial Crusades, and when desperate pleas for aid came from nearby systems, the Knights of Chimer marched with burning wrath against the enemies of mankind. Yet when the Cicitrix Maledictum tore across the stars, the Knights of House Chimer were amongst the nightmarish hosts who burst from the Great Rift to prey upon the worlds of the Imperium. Many of these once valiant engines were hideously twisted. The corruption that had evidently taken hold of them expressed in their grotesque forms and rampant cruelty. In an edict that caused great anguish to those they had once served, the knights of House Kaima were declared iconoclast, and Sutir's wake, now shrouded within the Imperium Nihilus, was marked for purgation. When the Indomitus Crusade reached Sotir's Wake, Adeptus Astarte's strike forces of the Ultramarines and White Scars chapter were tasked with launching an execution assault against the planet, backed up by massed Astra Militarum regiments. But the warriors of House Kaima offered no resistance to the Imperial attack. The nobility, seemingly untouched by chaos taint from what the Space Marines' initial scans and the divinations of their librarians could tell, could not fathom that they had been deemed traitors, sending out strident messages that protested the invasion and claiming they would not raise their weapons against those to whom they had sworn loyalty. Instead, the entire household withdrew from the planet to save their house. They marched their knights onto vast fleets of mass conveyance barges and fled from judgment by disappearing into the roiling tumult of the Great Rift. Where the timeless tides of the Empyrean took them, what horrors they encountered, or how long the Great Rift tormented them, none but they can ever tell. What is known to the Imperium is that lances of Kaimar knights continue to burst into reality along the length of the Cicitrix Maledictum. Where they appear, their wrath is quickly turned upon the defenders of the Imperium. Desperate attempts to treat with them by victims ignorant of their reputation have been met with silence or maddened ramblings, for what nobility once existed in the household is now long gone. The inexplicable confrontation upon Sutir's wake has been cited often in the years since by pattern savants and myth adepts seeking to correlate and prognosticate the renegades' future attacks. Use of the Imperial Tarot often connects their presence with the Fires of Injustice Triumph card or the Infernal Breath Minor Arcana card, Predicting where the Knights of Kaimar will appear is not easily done, and their sudden arrival at a system often means obliteration for Imperial forces nearby. On one such appearance, above the gas giant of Ro Sevier, a strike force from the White Scar Sixth Company defended the world's vital Ether Derricks against an invading host of Slaneshi demons. The Space Marines raced to secure the gigantic platforms suspended in the planet's thermosphere as ever more depraved beings poured from the nearby moor of the Great Rift. The fuel from those derricks were crucial for Imperial fleets, withdrawing from encroaching warp storms throughout the subsector. The demons outnumbered the White Scars a hundred times over, 
their presence buoyed by obscene choruses sung by psychic mutants among the platform's labouring underclass. The battle appeared to take a shift when a flotilla of mass conveyance barges swept into low orbit and disgorged its cargo of knights, but the hope of reinforcements was short-lived. As demons surged at the space marines in cavalcades of slicing blades, the knights of Kaimar opened fire on the force as well, obliterating those that had so far survived the demons' attacks. When cruisers from the Imperial Navy arrived to refuel, unaware of the war zone they were entering, the Chaos Knights departed, but not before overloading the core of each Aether Derrick. The ensuing chain reaction ignited the atmosphere of Rosafia, incinerating the refueling fleets as flame engulfed the entire planet. House Corvax Extinguish the Light of Hope from their mist-reeved keeps on the penumbral planet of Corvosi, the knights of House Corvax spread the dark corruption of chaos. Misery and fear are their heralds. These dread engines loom out of the cloying shadow that surrounds them like monolithic spectres. With dirge-like war horns blaring, they close in on their terrified foes, pulverizing them with deadly salvos of fire and crushing them beneath thunderous charges. Agents of anarchy, harbingers of terror, and ruinous heralds of the dark god's lust for destruction, the knights of House Corvax are corrupted and towering servants of chaos. This infernal house operates from a veiled and fractured planet within the Imperium Nihilus. Their fallen nobles are enthralled to a fell prince of chaos. Their knight's twisted appearance shows them to be suffused with the power of the warp. Many Corvax knights bear diabolical appendages and warp-powered cannons supplied by forge worlds of the Dark Mechanicum. Demonic entities, bound within their titanic forms, scream with soul-piercing fury, and coronas of darkness play about the knight's helms. It was not always so. The name of House Corvax has only been heard since the Great Rift's opening. No astrometric chart is ever known to record the presence of a star system in the region they now operate from. The truth is that Corvassi is a stolen world and was once Colossi, the home of the loyal House Raven. While the princeps of House Raven and most of his warriors were embroiled in the war for the Caradon subsector, the demon prince Belacor whispered into the minds of Colossi sacristans. Belacor manipulated the artisans into tainting the throne's mechanicum of those knights left to guard Colossi. When his demon hosts attacked the planet's keep inviolate, a full third of the defending knights turned on their fellows in Belacor's name. Before reinforcements could reach Colossi, Belacor completed his audacious theft. He spirited the entire planet away into the Imperium Nihilus and employed his dark powers to reshape the world into a form more pleasing to him. Belacor did the same with the knightly house he had stolen, allowing the Dark Mechanicum to get their talons upon what had once been a house loyal to the Adeptus Mechanicus. They corrupted stockpiles of night suits, as well as those aspirants who had not yet become, tainting their flesh and souls. Now House Corvax is a dark mockery of House Raven, and Belacor's sneering insult to the nobility of that great line. Warriors in service to Belacor, Militarum Tratoris regiments and Heretic Astartes warbands congregate around Corvesi. It is a staging ground for an empire of tyranny and terror. Chief amongst the force is House Corvax. When they attack a world, a shadow falls both physically and spiritually. The sun and stars are occluded. The planet's soldiers become fearful and morale weakens. Looming from within the shadow, the knights of Corvax unleash their attack as the defender's terror peaks. From coils of darkness, war dogs rush forward to slaughter vanguards. Tumbling banks of mist suddenly part to reveal charging knights' rampanger that crash through fortifications. 
The swirling energies are manipulated by darkly blessed knights adamant. Madness and mutation working to further the terror of House Corvax's assault. Corvessi is a world of mist and shadow, with a darkness so vast that it stretches into space. It makes the world appear to conventional augurs more as an absence against the backdrop of stars than a visible presence. Rumour and nightmarish tales are all that have reached the cognoscente of the Imperium. Fleeting glimpses of Corvessi's surface have fueled tales of immense chasms that scar a bleak, fractured landscape. Hypnotic balefires and monstrous machineries churn in their depths. Whispers have surfaced of gigantic land masses the size of continents that float in the skies, tethered by immense chains with links as broad as battleships. Upon one of these shards, there is said to stand a colossal fortress city, seething with wailing souls. At its pinnacle, so the tales recount, is an enormous throne upon which sits a brooding, malefic entity. House Vextrix. Duty is eternal. House Vextrix cling obsessively to their oaths of fealty unto death, no matter how abhorrent the duty or how fell the means required to meet them. The Knights of Vextrix embrace the corruptive power and status their unwavering devotions grant them. In so doing, their fallen nobles sink ever deeper into damnation. The Knights of House Vextrix are amongst the most loyal servants of the Legio Mortis Traitor Titan Legion, who are known to many in the Imperium as the Death's Heads. When the world of Daxos Gemini, upon which the Vextrix nobility ruled, was rediscovered during the Great Crusade, the Knights became fervent warriors of the Omnisire, waging devastating wars against all who opposed the Machine God. On several occasions, House Vextrix even fought alongside their Titan lieges as the Praetorian Guard of the Fabricator General of Mars. It was this unquestioning devotion that was to be their downfall. When the Death's heads fell to chaos, the entirety of House Vextrix followed them into damnation. Those named as enemies by Legio Mortis were also marked for death by the fallen nobles of Daxus Gemini, and wherever the traitor titans prosecuted their heretical wars, they were accompanied by lances of Vextrix knights. House Vextrix were amongst the heretics who participated in the massacre on Beta Gaumon, in which hundreds of loyalist and traitor titans were obliterated. Those Vextrix knights, who had expressed even the slightest reservations in siding with their bond lieges against the Imperium, were placed on the front lines, where they suffered the greatest losses. This only served to stoke the House's hatred of the Imperium and those who continued to blindly serve the Omnisire. Since being declared an infernal house, the Knights of Vextrix have welcomed the corrupting influence of the Dark Mechanicum. Some of the house's rigid traditions are influenced by the chilling logic of those heretics. This is most clearly expressed in the impersonal titles of those who rise to pilot night suits. House Vextrix comprises many separate branches of nobility linked by blood and shifting levels of subservience. Nobles are typically known only by the name of their lineage and a number identifying their successive rank. The influence of the Dark Mechanicum runs deeper than titles, however. The more warped a knight becomes, the higher their status. Cabals of idolaters, enthralled to Vextrix's nobility, toil in censor-hung forges and arcane weapon shops. They are eager to outdo each other by crafting warp-infused armaments, engine cores powered by warp entities, and mechano-sorcerous rune cogitators, all to win greater patronage. Dread campaigns are frequently launched to uncover repositories of knowledge that have remained hidden since the Dark Age of Technology, and to acquire Xenos machinery that the tech priests of the Imperium would consider heretical. Nor are the tech priests themselves safe. Rumours of hoarded archaeotech by radical forge worlds have drawn the gaze of House Vextrix. 
The onslaught that follows sees these forge worlds reduced to desecrated shells, their technocratic clergy blasted into bloody scrap. In millennia past, the Zitras were bondsmen of the Drixian line, at the beck and call of the more powerful noble family, though both branches of the wider house Vextrix. When Legio Mortis fell to chaos, however, the Drixians were among the few to renounce their oaths to the Titan Legion, proclaiming that their first duty was to the Omnisire. The Zitrian line repaid this lack of loyalty by turning upon their bond lieges. Before long, the dismembered corpses of the last Drixian was being mounted atop the gate of Vrea Keep in the heartland of Daxus Gemini. Over the centuries, the night suits of the Drixian nobles were bent to the will of the Zitris. Of these, Drixia's Moor proved to be the most stubborn, yet through unending tortures even it succumbed to the corruptions of chaos. Its current pilot is the 405th of her line. Though she has been bonded to the Night Rampager for under a decade, she has already made a name for herself as a fearsome combatant, cunning tactician and loyal servant of Legio Mortis. House Cormentis The Onolis are our prey. The Knights of House Cormentis are denounced as twice damned in the eyes of those Imperial nobles who have survived their attacks. Traitors to the Imperium and symbiotes of demonic powers, Knights of House Cormentis are deemed doubly dangerous. These Chaos Knights are hunters of beasts and monstrosities beyond compare, as adept at pursuing warp spawn as they are at hunting the lap dogs of the Imperium. House Cormentis was established on the desert planet of Metarach and developed a culture in which the predatory creatures that stalked its mountainous dunes were revered as hunting companions. Nobles trained for their becoming by setting out into the sandy wastes without food, water or weapons in pursuit of great beasts. Only after subduing and mastering one of these creatures would they return to the safety of their keeps. The nobles believe these animals served as eternal guides, and so the nature of the beast an aspirant captured determined the nature of the night suit to which they would be bonded. When Matarak was discovered by the Imperium during the Great Crusade, its indigenous fauna were quickly wiped out. Vast Mechanicum strip mines were constructed to extract the mineral wealth that lay beneath the sands, while towering processing hives belched toxins into the atmosphere, rendering the surface of the world inimical to all but the hardiest life forms. Protests from House Cormentis at the extermination of creatures so central to their culture were artfully acknowledged amid promises of great boons in the form of technology, unity and power. Cormentis knights eventually pledged themselves to the Omnisire and fought boldly for the Imperium throughout the Horus heresy. No one knows for sure if the bitterness and resentment undoubtedly seeded during those times ultimately led to the house's fall, though it seems likely to some among the Ordo Hereticus to have contributed to it. It was not until M33, when Metarach was engulfed by a demonic incursion that House Cormentus turned to chaos. No imperial record exists of the nightmares that befell the world, but Cormentus' knights now fought for the Dark Mechanicum. With lances that can spread across an entire continent, they close in around their enemy's position, encircling their prey and cutting off all routes of escape. Packs of war dogs surge forward as beaters, flushing out infiltrating vanguard forces, harrying infantry formations and disrupting the cohesion of war engine squadrons with swift strikes and rapid feints. As the larger hunters of a Cormentis hunting party stalk in the war dog's wake, they obliterate large prey marked for death by their underlings' initial strikes. Targets of opportunity are identified and crippled before they can withdraw, sending a clear message to the remainder of any resistance. In place of predatory animals, the fallen nobles now seek out demons as a rite of passage allowing themselves to become possessed so that the warp entities can intermingle with their throne mechanicum and the machine spirits of their night suits. 
Over long years, these demons eat away at their hosts, twisting their flesh, mutilating their minds, and eventually devouring their souls. The fate of many such pilots is to be torn from their thrones as their body collapses into a fleeting warp fissure. This horrific end is seen as a form of divine apotheosis, but one that is staved off for as long as possible, while the pilot and knight employ the power granted by demonic bonding. During the final nightmarish implosion, more chaos entities are loosed into reality, and these too are hunted by new aspirants, eager to test their mettle against rapacious warp spawn. Any damage to the throne mechanicum caused by the fissure is painstakingly repaired by cabals of idolaters, and the grotesque cycle of possession eternally propagates. Chronicles of Terror Lone dreadblades have posed a significant threat to Imperial forces for thousands of years. Whether striking frontier settlements or hunting dangerous wastes alone, fighting beneath another's banner or leading entire armies of their own, these warriors are often impossible to predict. Loosed from the oversight of a dread household court and the shackles of permanence that a home world represents, dread blades plague the galaxy as roving, nightmarish abominations. Tales of individual dread blades and the ruinous paths they carve across the stars have evolved over time into myths and cautionary tales. Many benighted regions of the Imperium are home to dark legends of such shadowy monstrosities. They are whispered around guttering electro-lanterns by frontier miners, told by rot gut fuel guards in the dark watches of the night, or spread by rogue traders to warn off potential rivals from prime trade routes. The ecclesiarchy dismiss these rumours as the wanderings of enfeebled minds lacking the surety of faith. Even some bombastic inquisitors scoff at such tales, seeing them as born out of local megafauna or xenos attacks. Yet many such stories are all too true, the product of nightmarish attacks by masterless chaos knights. Lone dreadblades may have been abandoned upon a feral world, unable to leave and surrounded by a shrinking cabal of fawning idolaters. In such cases, the fallen nobles only release from their company may be its rapacious attacks on terrified townships that see it as a demonic beast. Some haunt lesser-used trade routes, preying upon luckless merchants, with so many stable warp routes made impassable by the emergence of the Great Rift. Passages and channels once viewed as too dangerous or cursed are being braved by the desperate or foolhardy, who realise only too late they have entered a Dreadblade's hunting grounds. Even bereft of their lordly peers, a fallen knight on the path of the Dreadblade is not alone. They are attended by a body of arcane idolaters who maintain the knight's panoply and weapons. Such cabals of techno-sorceress artisans may have been cast out alongside the Chaos Knight, eternally tied to the noble's fate, for better or worse. Some idolaters willingly pledge themselves to a lone dreadblade, seeing the opportunity to rise in the noble's favour and, in the warrior's unfettered state, the chance to acquire knowledge and power denied to them by more senior cults of their former house. Equally, not all dreadblades fight alone. Some gravitate towards similarly dispossessed or forgotten chaos knights, drawn together by some instinctive need for hierarchy, or perhaps, unknowingly, directed by the will of the Dark Gods. Roving bands of Dreadblades are a blight upon the galaxy, capable of crushing entire enemy armies beneath their stride. Still, other lone Chaos Knights fall in league with the heretic Astartes, cults of demon worshippers or rebellious armies of turncoats. Among these traitors, the Dreadblade fights as a sickeningly powerful mercenary, often uncaring of their allies' cause, yet eager to unleash their fury. The natural superiority and callous martial pride of a fallen noble alone can dominate weaker wills with ease. Coupled with the power of their corrupted night suit, some amass legions of cowed militarum traitoris soldiery or fervent chaos cultist worshippers. 
These devotees see the Dreadblade as their monstrous king, anointed by the power of the gods of chaos and worthy of any foul obeisance it commands. The following are a selection of some of the more well-known mechanical horrors that consider themselves Dreadblades and are a blight upon all of reality. The Triumvirate of Torment Scrawled images of the Chaos Knights known as the Triumvirate of Torment have appeared among pre-warp human and Xenos civilizations throughout the St. Meredith Strait. The Knight Abominant, Thrastelagor, leads them, eldritch energies twisting in the mantle of shadow that gathers about it. Flashes of multi-hued sorcery within the darkness reflect from Thrastelagor's crimson flanks, catching cursed runes that shimmer with warp light. The fallen noble at its core, Grigor Carolus, is fused within his throne mechanicum. His flesh is stretched and melded with machinery and unpleasant growths. Upon Threstelagor's carapace, three psychers hang impaled on rusting spikes, uh, tormented by wraith like uh, terror shades. Corallus feeds on their essence, letting it wind around his electro scourge and soak into Threstelagor's fabric. The unknown fallen noble within Talon of Ruin communicates only with snarls and metallic growls blasted from the night rampages emitters. Not even Corollus's sorcery has been able to determine whether there remains a human occupant upon the Chaos Knight's throne. Talon of Ruin's fractured, tilting shield and dented pauldrons bear faded imagery from several ancient houses, but its silent idolaters, missing tongues, and with their mouths stitched together or welded over, are unable to tell the reason. The third of their cohort is the most voluble. Its armour is lacquered in lurid colours, and emitters blaring with deafening tributes to murder. Regent of Nostria is a knight desecrator, whose heraldry of sinuous sigils and writhing figures openly displays its pilot's worship of Slanesh, the chaos god of excess. Nicodemus, the Amrathian, skillfully cripples enemy war engines with Regent's laser destructor. Left defenceless, the knight tears them apart, plucking screaming crew from within with its massive barbed talons. Together, the Triumvirate of Torment have formed an unlikely alliance, each fueling the other's need for destruction and reaping the rewards their wars provide. In their wake, the Chaos Knights' idolaters and enslaved thralls fall upon wounded foes, dragging them away to an eternity of servitude and worship of their titanic masters. Damas, Gruel, and Woeseeker Once mistress of the Noctilucent Feared and Thrall Flayer of Dinesh, Damas Gruel abandoned the ranks of House Forest when she was declared a traitor for killing two of the king's heirs. That they had been worthless fops in her eyes was ignored. Damas saw then that her murders had come too late. The rot of decadent inertia was eroding what had once been iron-willed warriors. Gruel escaped her circling enemies, casually sacrificing many loyal bondsmen, to take her lightning-blazoned knight despoiler, Woe-seeker, and forge a path of destruction worthy of its name. They have not rested in the dark years since. Garul and Woe-seeker have raised forge moons, ambushed imperial landing sites, plundered millennia-old techno-archives and slaughtered imperial and xenos forces in their dozens, striking like a thunderclap. She despises inactivity, worthless posturing and superfluous greed. Where Gruul perceives even a suggestion of failure or caution, she ruthlessly stamps it out and moves on without pause. Woe Seeker's temporary pacts with the Black Legion warband of Kalesh Gertz, the radiant disciples of Nonavoth the, and traitors of the Daflin 223rd Pioneer Corps, have become infamous for their brevity and their bloody conclusions. Woe Seeker tore through the Zench worshippers of Nonavath mid-battle, 
when they paused in their assault to enact a sorcerer's ritual, driving the terrified survivors before it to soak up imperial firepower and clog the enemy's blades. It contemptuously crushed warlord Gertz beneath one massive foot during the warrior's elaborate shouting challenge to his salamander's opponent, before obliterating the Imperial commander with a battle cannon shell and leading the remaining Black Legion to tear open the gates of Fundus Brigantis. For the Commandant of the Deathland 223rd, issuing his strategy from the rear lines in the safety of a command tank, Damas Gruel offered him a more front-line role. Hefting the Commandant's tank in one giant gauntlet, she hurled it into the enemy's midst, where it detonated like an oversized grenade. Woeseeker strode through the gap the explosion had torn open in the foe's defence, cannons already firing as Gruel watched for the next laps from those around her. Hope's Shroud In M36, the former Freeblade, known as Hope's Shroud, pledged its loyalty to the ecclesiarch Gorg van Dyer. In the name of faith, it massacred soldiers who fought to depose the tyrannical High Lord and was even sent to eliminate its master's greatest detractor, Sebastian Thor. But before Hope's Shroud could carry out its charge, Thor brought his armies to terror. Van Dyer was eventually slain by members of his own bodyguard, the warriors who would go on to found the Adepta Sororitas. Upon learning that its liege had been murdered and named a traitor, the fallen noble and knight turned their hatred and weapons against all who followed the Imperial Creed. Hope Shroud's pilot rejected the Imperial faith and instead embraced with greater fervour the creed of those the Imperium deemed heretics, allying with heretical warbands to aid them in their vendetta the noble and knight sought out the most faithful servants of the Imperium so that they could slaughter in Van Dyer's name. Litany of Destruction The Living Litany, a free-blade knight, was the epitome of the questing champion. Driven by honour, this warrior travelled across battlefields, driving back Xenos and heretical foes alike. None know the truth behind the living Litany's fall and its transformation into the monster known as the Litany of Destruction. Some say that a freak warp storm enveloped the pilot and his war machine during the Battle of Cranav Hexis. Others claim that the knight was exposed to a biomechanical contagion by agents of the Dark Gods. Some simply contend that the Litany of Destruction's lust for slaughter and devastation has become so all-encompassing that the allegiance of its victims has ceased to matter. Whatever the truth, where once the litany's vox arrays blared sermons of worship in high Gothic, they now howl deranged diatribes as the war machine enters the field of combat. Decima and Incarnate Slaughter once known as Incarnate Valor, this murderous knight rampager and its pilot, Decima, fell to chaos in the throes of battle. They marched to war as part of the Grand Lance of House Meriden, in which every last knight of the household strove to halt the rampant advance of High Fleet Hydra that was fast approaching their world. Their bold, final charge was doomed to failure. Outnumbered by a factor of billions, each knight was cut down and picked apart by the unending Xenos swarms. Incarnate Valor was the last warrior standing, and in its pilot's mind remained a single imperative. Kill. When the knight was waist-high in ichor and butchered alien flesh, a warp breach appeared beneath its feet, drawing the raging engine into the Empyrean. Since then, Incarnate Slaughter has appeared on dozens of other worlds, arising from lakes of gore and continuing its rampage. Though it is primarily drawn to worlds infested by tyranids, the Night Rampager will turn its rage on any enemy which it is faced with. Hatred of Crastolan After the Horus heresy, the nobles of the Loyalist House Hawkshroud created a knightly title 
whomsoever had this title would pilot the night suit Hatred of Castellan, and shoulder grave and harrowing burdens, answering the most unthinkable calls to arms. It was the hatred of Castellan that attacked allies suspected of treachery, executing valiant generals alongside whom it had once fought, and slaughtering those obedient soldiers who served the condemned. It was this night that meted out punishment upon planets where, due to hostile invasions, the populace had been unable to prefer their tithe of flesh to the Imperium. In M34, the throne mechanicum of the night could bear these duties no more, and its remnant spirits cried out in collective fury. They declared themselves the true high monarch of House Hawkshroud, for, by the Code Chivalric, no king or queen would issue an order they themselves were unwilling to carry out. The hatred of Crastalan was declared an enemy to Hawkshroud, and thus began its long descent into chaos. Kiro and Sire of Doom During the Nos catastrophe, which saw half a dozen forge worlds overrun by the Dark Mechanicum, the knights of House Dayton were captured while trying to defend servants of the Omnisire. Their captors took them into the screaming heart of a soul forge, wiring the knights into colossal torture devices. For a whole year, the Dayton knights endured as agonised warp currents were sent surging through them. One after another, they were consumed by their suffering, their bodies tearing apart from the sheer intensity of the pain. As each expired, their share of anguish was spread across those who were still alive, until only Kiro remained within his night, sire of doom. The night thrashed and roared as its circuits flooded with the tortured sensations of the nobles of House Dayton. The hateful Magi then finished their ritual by sealing Kiro in his state of utter despair, blinding him to all other thoughts. Wherever Sire of Doom now marches, the last knight of Dayton lashes out mindlessly at all who stand before him, seeing the scarred and twisted faces of his captors at every turn. Kiro's Dark Mechanicum masters know this and unleash the tormented Sire of Doom wherever it will cause the most destruction. The Gilded King the bellicose knight, desecrator, piloted by the fallen high monarchs of House Iongor, is known as the Gilded King. In the distant past, the knight suits of each of the monarch's bondsmen bore a golden escutcheon, upon which was emblazoned the house's sigil. These warriors were unfalteringly loyal to their liege, but at some point the royal line fell to chaos, and began executing those who served it. Piloting the Gilded King, the first treacherous High Monarch, cut down the other knights one by one, prizing the loyalist noble pilots from their thrones and ending their lives on the edge of a massive Reaper chainsword. The golden sigils were then stripped from each slain engine and added to the carapace of the Gilded King. With the noble households violently exterminated, the fallen High Monarch set about eradicating all traces of civilization from the surface of the night world. All records of the Gilded King before this time of madness were incinerated, as were the names of the royal nobles who piloted it. Many other noble lines have since been savaged by this mechanical monstrosity, yet the true nature of who pilots it remains unknown. And with that, good and loyal citizens, we shall end this Voxcast, having explored the loyal and the traitor. May the Emperor protect. Thank you for watching, everybody. Bit of a law video for a change. Uh, got another big law video coming. If you're watching now, in the future, I guess it doesn't matter. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. You can see your names scrolling by as we talk and I hit things. 
and you might be able to hear them pinging as I wave my arms around. But thank you to everybody who does support the channel. You guys really, really help um, keep the channel going. And if you'd like to support the channel, please do consider becoming a YouTube member or a patron on Patreon. Either way, you will get your name added to this roll call of honour. And uh, I really appreciate that massively. Uh, if you can't do that, please do like the video and let me know in the comments what you think. Those two things massively help a channel like mine grow. And um, yeah, that would be fantastic and I really appreciate it. More stuff coming soon. I hope you enjoyed this. I will be back again very, very soon. That's all for now. Tara, bye-bye. Cheers.